It's quiet. Let's talk about Japan has me thinking it's only a matter of time before they, someone puts in a vending machine where you put in a credit card and it spits out a remote production kit. I think it'd be great. I'm pretty sure someone in, that's already there's there. somewhere in Akihabara that has that already, I think. But it's probably right under big camera, right at the bottom. They're like, don't even come in, just, just, just buy your studio, get out of here, get moving. Like in China for all the corporate influencers streaming from the factories or something like that. It is the weird, you've seen that scene where they're all under a bridge. Yeah. There's hundreds of them that are all along the road under a bridge doing streams because of the location based in we in Weibo or whatever. Yeah. That is a crazy photo. A vending machine with kits with like a camera and a phone, I'm sure would do well there. Actually, I think you're right. That would actually just, is just the stuff for you. Oh, Let's get out of this business and just go make make kits for vending machines. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about digital media production. And our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about remote production. I want to talk about to our, our resident experts uh, here in Office Hours and answer your questions. So if you've got questions about remote production, how does it work? Uh, how do people put it together? Go ahead and throw those into Makana right now for the second hour. And if you've got uh, qu general questions about digital media production, throw them in for the first hour, general questions. You can tag them in Mukana as such. Um, so uh, go ahead and throw those in right now and make sure to vote on the questions. Uh, that really helps us decide which ones to ask first. Speaking of questions, let's go ahead and jump to the questions. Courtney, what do we have? Well, first one up is Douglas Carmichael, and he wants to know where could you get flat, flat cat five cable suitable for running on apartment walls without damaging them? I'll go ahead, Courtney. Uh, well, there's this uh, thing called Amazon, and I found some uh, flat cat, and I love to say flat cat, uh, <laughs> Jadol Cat 6 Ethernet cable. It's flat, and it comes with these little uh, uh, special tie downs that you can hammer into your baseboards uh, to only slightly damage your apartment. Uh, so I guess you could find some double stick tape and glue it down, but uh, they do make it and it's not too expensive. 12 bucks for 50 feet. I go with Jeffrey. Yeah. Uh, you're going to have a hard time trying to, first of all, finding cat five flat. Uh, you want to, and of course, getting cat six is going to be better. You're going to have better uh, response off of that as a flat cable. I would highly suggest, because I've done this before, don't buy the cable with the ends on it, because once you clip the ends off, you realize that they don't color code uh, like uh, like you're expecting. So you're going to have to uh, you're going to have to set up your own color coding and remember that, especially if you clip off the ends and and have to redo it. Uh, but I, what I would do is uh, save yourself some money, get the rounded stuff, and then as Courtney said, you know, different ways to fasten it. They have those little uh, wall items that uh, I don't know what you call them, but basically they're sheaths. That uh, that stick up uh, using double sided tape and uh, and then that'll that'll look a lot cleaner than even flat cable would. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, just wanted to throw my two cents in as well. The the brand that Courtney uh, suggested there, I actually bought that about a year ago in a Cat Seven flavor. Happily hammered it into my baseboards, been running it fine, so it's been stable so far. That's great. Uh, next question. Sorry, <laughs> that's me. Uh, uh, coming in from uh, John Foltz in uh, Sellings Grove, Pennsylvania. A hair trigger mouse? My Logitech MX Anywhere 3S wireless started getting touchy. It likes to double click instead of single click. I slowed down the click in perfs, uh, prefs, but it's still fussy. I'm single clicking as fast as I can. Ideas? Euthanize it? Euthanize it. 
it's it's a contact problem inside of it. So that it's in the button. You would have to take the button apart, and that contact has been worn, um, and or you probably hit it too hard. If you were me, you probably tapped it really hard because something wasn't working um, a couple too many times. And so it's uh, it's anyway. It it is. Uh, there's a contact closure in there, and it's sticking. Um, and um, I think that. Uh, or it's not sticking one or the other. It's either not moving down or it's, it's stuck down and uh, getting it fixed will cost you more than another mouse. So I would just get another mouse. Next question. This one comes in from uh, Mitch Hill in Wilmington, Delaware. Could Alex describe his current remote package? Yeah, I, I should take, I, I, my, the next time I have a remote cap package, I'm gonna have a second camera so I can show you where I'm at. Uh, I am actually here in Los Angeles in uh, Studio Place Productions. And uh, they're, they, uh, they have a, a cool little studio here and they were kind enough to let me actually use it. So I'm here, so I've got pretty good lights and a set and everything else to sit in. I still kind of carry my own gear with me just because I know it. And, uh, and this is like a little case, I'm always testing it. Uh, I'm using a Sony FX30 with a, a 1.4 35 millimeter G series. Um, and it's nice because I just set it up and it mostly just uh, figures out the focus and everything else for me. Um, that's going into a, uh, an ATEM uh, a Mini, just a standard um, Mini Pro, actually. I have a Mini Pro, so it's a Mini Pro, um, but it's just, that's going USB-C into my computer. Um, I have a Mix Pre with a noise assist and a uh, DPA 4066 that I'm talking into. And, um, and I have a little uh, <laughs> a, a laptop lift for my, uh, for my MacBook Pro. And uh, that is pretty much my whole little kit. And, uh, and again, usually I have lights and other things, but because uh, Studio Place already have, has all of those things, uh, I didn't have to bring it with me. Go ahead, Chris. You said 35 millimeter. Is that a prime lens? Uh, it is a prime lens. Yeah, because I really, really wanted, wanted 1.4 uh, f-stop, and you, you really stuck at 2.8. Uh, with um with a zoom lens and so what's your what's your f-stop set at now then my f-stop right now is at 1.4 yeah so i i have a cheap sigma ish sigma lens that i was recommended to buy when i bought my 6k mm -hmm. and it's f point one point eight. but i've been uh teased by certain back-end crew members about the depth of field seems like i'm trying too hard so i actually run my uh, depth of field at about, I think, three. Well, I, my f stop rather. I don't think you can make it too soft. Well, you can. You can't make it too soft. But yeah, F3. on a super thirty-five, I mean, I, I I would open it all the way up. I mean, that's what I do. So I so one point four is what I have here. If if I had, if I was using a full size sensor right now, I'm using a super thirty-five. If I was using a full size sensor, I would um, definitely. Uh, what does the 6K have? Is that full size? No, nope, that's super 35. So the so 6K and the FX30 have the same uh, sensor size. The A7, um, the A7 IV, or and 3 and 2 are all full size sensors. And so at that point, I probably would have gotten a zoom lens because 2.8 would be fine, you know, in that in that area. So so that's kind of the decision process for me. Um, I find that this is about the for me, it's about the right amount of depth of field that I can create in a you know number maybe. On, on over this shoulder, maybe four or five feet from the from the background, and over this shoulder, maybe a little further, six or seven feet. Yeah. So, so it's um, but you know, I'm I'm always kind of, I think it looks nicer to pop out a little bit more. So, so I I I'm kind of a fiend for. I don't like the full frame 1.4, like it just fades out into nothing. Look, you know. So so, but I but I do like the like the look. fake zoom. Yeah, when it feels like a fake zoom uh, look, I, I don't. I think that that's too much. Uh, I think that's probably one of the problems with the fake zoom look. Uh, you know, and most of them zoom or or uh, Skype or or all of those tend to blur too much. The one that actually does pretty well is the M1 based um, Apple one that is built for cameras that, that that's built in there is actually not that bad um, at that at that process. So at thirty five millimeters. Prime, how far is the lens from your face? Can you About reach forward feet. and so you touch can't it. touch it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because a Super Thirty Five is essentially a fifty-two millimeter lens. I mean, I, I mean, a, a, on a Super Thirty Five, the thirty-five millimeter is a fifty-two. So I'm about at a full five, same frame sensor. I'm about fifty millimeter lens. So yeah, about four feet is, is what I have to. And I just you know kind of plan that into what I'm doing. Um, I just know what distance I need to be at to make that work. It's, and is uh, there any yeah. software that you can get? to help you adjust that camera like you can do there is. with the black magics through the switcher yeah there's a, there's a um there's there is a i can't think of it right now i think someone else might be able to um annotate it for us but there is a there are a couple things that'll talk to the sony 
I have not found them to be very successful. <laughs> so someone to keep people keep on telling me that they're really good and I can't get them to, to, to stick with it. So I, I'm still using just, just grabbing onto the camera. So um, if you need to adjust something right now, you actually have to stand up and reach over and I shouldn't be. I think that there's some, there is some way that I should be able to do that. And I just, I haven't quite figured out. But what today is. that's the way you're doing. It. Yeah. I mean, the problem is, is that this eight, this FX 30 and I, um, part of the reason I take it on the road is the FX30 is really my webcam. And so it works really, it's kind of set up in my house and it works really well. And when I take it out, I'm like, oh, what do I have to do here? And how do I push this over? And so I'm kind of forcing myself to, it's, it's still new for me um, to, to, to kind of learn those bits and pieces. Okay. Thanks. Next question. This one comes in from uh, Douglas Carmichael. He says, I've installed a Windows 10 virtual machine in my home lab, and I'd like to set up uh, dedicated virtual machines for Windows apps like Universe. However, I'm unable to activate Windows on the second virtual machine. How many machines can you use one Windows product key with? Go ahead, Jonas. You can use one. And then even, even with virtualization, it's weird because sometimes um, if you spec up or spec down the CPU or other features, it will register it as new hardware. So you need to be sure that it's not a license that is bound to the CPU because that's what Windows often does. Also, I really wouldn't spin up like a whole Windows uh, VM for all of the different programs, like the overhead of DOS for every single program would be much higher than you just spinning it up within Windows on the same Windows. Um, it's nice for management, but you'll have much more overhead, much more Windows instances to manage. Now you need to like build up an infrastructure for that. I I would just put it on one for now. Go, Jeffrey. Yeah, even enterprise uh, enterprise uh, setups, uh, they, some of them do have one key, but you're you're paying a lot for it. If you're testing via virtual machine, you can load Windows on, and you'll just have that little watermark in the bottom corner. You won't have to put in a key, uh, and then you, every, I think it's every thirty days you have to uh, to revalidate, and you can't put on a, a background or whatever. So, but a lot of people use virtual machines like that. Um, if you're putting them in production, you'll definitely want to get a key for them. And then uh, think about getting OEM keys over regular uh, Windows keys because OEM keys will be cheaper. There'll be absolutely no support for them, but you technically don't need them because you're going to be using for a virtual machine anyway. Good, Courtney. Yeah, that's, uh, the the licensing fee for Windows has got to be, you know, for Windows professional OEM, I think even the OEM is 200 bucks. So that's why I buy these little... Uh, little PCs like this. They're on their own processor. It comes with a licensed version of Windows 11 Pro on it, which is $200 if you just buy the license alone and you get a free quad-core PC to run it on. So get one of those in a KVM. Uh, next question. This one from uh, Graham uh, Cardwell in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And he says in the uh, version 18.5 Resolve Studio Beta, you can un- can you undo or redo the transcription? It says, I have changed the transcribed text file, but can't undo and redo transcribe. Uh, just produces the amended file again. Um, I think that what you want to do there uh, is to export it out. And I don't know how you exported it out to do the correction, but I would export it out as an SRT, um, then do the correction in a, in a caption-ready uh, editor. Uh, and with SRT, it should come out as just a text file. So SRT, VTT, a lot of those are very similar in structure. So export an SRT. You can then do the edits on that SRT and then re-import it as an SRT, not as whatever file that you might have put it together. And if that's what you did, then I don't then I'll have an answer. But but if but generally you want to bring it in new into Resolve or Final Cut as an SRT file, and it should just line all back up the way it the way it was before. Next question. Next question comes in from uh, Rayon Smith in uh, Trinidad, West Indies. He says, hello, all. What's a great starter pay-per-view streaming platform or combinations of apps and hardware with low cost to use, which then can grow as the audience grows? Maybe give us a high, medium, and low-level tier options, as well as for future knowledge. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead, Grant. Yeah, there's a couple of different ones uh, that I've looked into before, and, and we kind of came back to Vimeo. Um, so it kind of starts there. Vimeo, um, you, you can do with their basic sort of, their, it's called an advanced plan. They changed their plans recently, and uh, 
but you can you can totally use that to live stream and you could tie that into lots of WordPress, you know, sort of sites that you could build out of site as a starter. Um, and you could put a paywall on that and you could make all that work. There is also um, registration and attendee services that Vimeo has in that basic plan. Um, and that could work well for you as well. So you could charge for people to, to access whether it's live um, pay-per-views or, or on demand. Uh, and then they've got a uh, Vimeo OTT as well, which is, um, uh, that would be the high end of, of what you're talking about. So then uh, that would, you can build apps out with that and and um, you could go the, the whole way that you'd want to, that would scale as far as you'd want to, but two very separate different products or service offerings that Vimeo has, but I think it's a great place to start. Yeah, the really interesting thing about the Vimeo uh, solutions is that you can integrate OT, you can integrate in the OTT apps, you can integrate live as v, as well as VOD. So you can have whole shelves of VOD stuff, but then you can also insert live events and so on and so forth. Uh, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, plus one on Vimeo as well. Um, but uh, what's interesting, it's about 75 a month for the streaming plan. But what's cool about it is you can actually have three simultaneous uh, streams at the same time from different sources going on. So that that plan does include those three. Um, and uh, you can also embed, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty good, I think it's a pretty good deal. You also don't have to worry about getting flagged or anything like that. If you're doing live music during the event, um, you're not going hit, to get hit with anything right then. Yeah, go ahead, Grant. Just a couple of changes. Recently, they, they changed their plans. And so now it's only two simultaneous streams that you can do unless you have um, an enterprise plan. And the other thing that they make explicit now, it used to just be kind of hidden away, but it, it's explicit that it's two terabyte um, bandwidth per month. Um, it must be under that. And, uh, and that's Two terabyte is pretty easy to get over um, <laughs> yeah. when you do it. <laughs> it's, it's, when you do it, live stream. Like, yeah, you can move that really fast. I'm, I've worked on shows yeah. where I think we do that about every second. So, so it's uh, so yeah, so it's uh, it's uh, it's an easy one if you're if you're doing any kind of significant stream. Uh, go ahead, Ronnie. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, a, a few of the problems we had with Vimeo is uh, going over the, the the limits. We used Vimeo for many years and. They are starting to to crack down on those that are, have a lot of uh, viewers. Yeah, go Grant. Oh, can you hear me? Grant? I'm done. Okay, <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm done. I saw your I saw your name. <laughs> then come back up again. Yeah, the um, okay. uh, with um, I think that I, I feel like they really kind of cornered this market. Like they just, especially I think that the the real soft point is if you have. For live viewers, if you have a, you know less than two thousand that you're expecting to have on any given concurrent, um, so if you have less than two thousand concurrent, if, if it's you know so you're kind of in that smaller market there, um, then you can you can really build it. Now there are when you talk about low, medium, high, Vimeo is kind of the medium level, you know, and you can get in at low. Um, then when you get into larger streams, there are more. Um, you know, you can start talking about Bright Cove. Um, you can talk, you know, Kaltura will do some stuff from a VOD perspective. Uh, there is um, On Studio or um, uh, U Studio, uh, which does a lot of podcasting production. So they do that for a lot of corporate and they're out of Austin. And then, um, and then when you talk about really industrial grade work, you're talking about uh, companies like Akamai. So those are things to, to there are, you know, so you can definitely grow into a lot of other things. But I think if I'm looking at what am I going to turn the turn on um, as I'm getting started, I think Vimeo's probably got the most features all in one place that are going to let you do what you want to do. Now, next question. Can't hear you. I, yeah, I have one of those bad mouse buttons like we were talking yeah, about go. earlier. <laughs> Paul <laughs> Wallace from Austin, Texas says, would the Sony WH-1000XM headset with noise canceling ambient sound and et cetera, be effective as a headset or less likely as a headset uh, and a microphone for comms. Uh, go ahead, Ronnie. Well, we used those for uh, for a few years and um, I would not um, rely on those microphones. Uh, headsets for noise cancelling is uh, almost perfect and they're really, really good. High performance, long battery life, really good, except the latest one, uh, we are discussing if they change the drivers in that. But um, as for microphones, they have never been satisfying for me. Next question. 
comes in from uh, Berlin, and Andre Adole says, when I cloud record a Zoom meeting, will I get recordings of the breakout rooms as well? I go, Jonas. No. <laughs> There's the most direct. Not that he's bitter. Uh, go ahead, Grant. Uh, so, no. Um, yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a shame. He yeah, agrees. Let's see. Let's see. Um, so, uh, do you know what's interesting is my, my uh, Zoom just froze up um, for a moment there. So, I... I missed if if uh, Jonas already answered. Did you? Did the, no. is that what happened? We, we all agree on no, no, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, but, all right, no, okay. Well, so he, no, you can't. But he, here's the thing. I mean, it, it is um, it is something that would be amazing if they if they brought it in because of of how we use breakout rooms all the time. And um, but of course, so you just remember that you can do local recording um, within a within a breakout room. Um, and so that can give you something depending on how you set up your computer and what, it, what that seeing on the screen is what it will record. Um, that recording can all, you can also do, um, isolated audio, um, ISO audio, um, in, uh, on a local recording. And so that's something else as well. So that's, that's just with the stock standard app. Um, you can do that. And then of course, there's lots of ways with, with zoom ISO and, and other ways of, um, getting, the uh, the recordings out of those breakout rooms, so it is it is possible, but not on the on the uh, uh, cloud, the not Zoom the cloud recordings. Yeah, not That's the right. vanilla cloud recording. And and this is a great example of a value add that you can bring to your customers is using something like Zoom ISO and being able to drop it into every meeting that you wanted to record, and just uh, and record those um, shows. You can just record the active speaker, so you get everybody there, or you could even go in and grab all of the sessions and pull all the ISOs. I mean, that would be quite a little process, but it, it all can be done and it all can be done in the cloud. Um, your cloud, not Zoom's cloud. Next question. Next question comes in from uh, Tim Holm here on the panel and from San Lorenzo, California. He says, is there a way to get rid of the mouse pointer on my Wacom One? I go ahead, Richard. Yeah, in, in my experience so far, the only way is to choose a software that hides it for you. So um, there are a couple that, that do that, um, uh, that, that can be really helpful. Um, the one I'm testing at the moment is the one that Juan is, is making uh, for older machines. So I, I, I can't demonstrate uh, some of the other ones, but uh, I've noticed that a couple of different whiteboard apps, as well as um, John Barker's H2R graphics, I think they, they automatically hide the, the, the cursor for you, uh, rather than necessarily being a feature of the tablet and pen. So it's about the software that you're using. Next question. From Alexander Knight in Vancouver, BC, Canada, and here on the panel says, I've, I've been researching older Sony A6000 series cameras and notice that the A6400 only supports 24 or 60p on the HDMI output, which makes it a no-go if you need 30. Does anyone know if the A6500 corrects this? Yeah, I don't know if it corrects it or not. Um, one thing to, to note is that you can get away a lot of times, a lot of times your software, are you trying to, Alex, are you trying to connect this to like Zoom or something else like that? Well, I haven't bought one yet, but I was just looking okay. at that. I do, as soon as I saw that, I said, well, that's not going to work. If I want native 30. Here's the thing is that if, if you send it into something like Zoom, Zoom's just going to throw away every other frame. And the way to make it look like 30 is uh, to, if you set your shutter speed to 360, at 60 frames a second, that will give you the proper uh, shutter speed for 30 frames a second, uh, because it's now you doubled it and then you're cutting it in half again. So that so the 360 at one at, at 60 frames a second is the same as 180 at 30 frames a second. And so what you can do is you can use a if it's only doing 60 frames a second, you can run everything in 60. Um, and then you can just let zoom throw away half the frames and it should be fine. The same thing was you could, you could even have your ATEM set to 30 and have it throw away half the frames for you. So you can have the camera plugged in it, the, the ATEM throws away half the frames, delivers it to zoom and, uh, uh, and and you would, it would look exactly the same as if you were using 30 frames a second. Um, so it's not the end of the world uh, to to have it um, as a 60 frame per second delivery. Um, that, that's the way you would cheat it. We we had to do that a lot because we would end up with 60 frame sources and we were streaming, of course, at 30 uh, for YouTube. And um, and what we found was that if we just made sure that everybody doubled there, if it were, if we were the most important, they would set it to 360 as opposed to um, 
uh, and and then it would look it would look a little little dreamy, you know, at, at for the sixty frame per second, but no one notices at sixty. And the funny thing is, is that when we shoot one hundred and twenty, we always leave it at, at three hundred and sixty shutter because um, one hundred and twenty for some reason looks framey. It shouldn't, but it looks there's something about it that looks framey at one hundred and eighty degrees. And I don't have a scientific reason for that, but it just looks better at at the three hundred and sixty uh, shutter. Next question. Coming in from uh, Tim Holm in San Lorenzo, California, he says, has anyone played with the new speech denoise block feature in Audio Hijack? You know, we had dinner last night here in L.A., and, uh, and I think that we, somebody had tested it. I can't remember who said that they had tested it, but somebody had tested it at dinner, and they said that the noise assist uh, for sound devices was still much better than what was what was going out in Audio Hijack. So it, it may be an improvement, but it's not a replacement for a lot of what we're, what we're doing and what we're using now. Uh, next question. Alexander Knight in uh, Vancouver, BC says, for Alex Lindsay, what aperture do you run the lens at on your FX3? Where do you find a good balance between shallow depth of field without softening your image too dramatically? Yeah, so I'm. this is an FX30, not an FX3. So, um, so but but as, as, as the FX30, uh, I'm running at 1.4. Um, and so, and I find that for most of the things that I've been doing, I really like that that really soft depth of field. I think if the background is too far back, um, and like if I was outside, it might just look like a wash. And then you have to start dialing that back in so people can actually see it. But it, it really is nice, especially when you don't have anything specific you're trying to show in the background. If I had a shelf back there and I really wanted you to see something, I might tighten up that that um, that setting just a little bit. Um, so that those are the things that I would kind of um, consider here. I like to pop out a little bit. So I think that, that what I have right now is something that I'm, um, that I'm happy with. Um, I can always close it down if I wanted to go ahead, Alex. Yeah. And so with, with you in the, in the foreground, do you, do you find that, uh, you're like, you, you, your facial features still look tack sharp, even at fully yeah. open at the yeah. gym? Yeah. I mean, cause the, I mean, I don't know, you can tell me what, what, what it looks like, but from, from my vantage point, no matter what, and, and what's nice about this, I mean, this is why I moved for my, for my webcam to FX30 is because when I do this, you can see my hand is in focus, you know, and then I do this and it, and it pulls right back to my face. And so no matter what I do here, this was the real challenge when I was traveling with the Blackmagic 6K is that like what the situation that I'm in right now was very difficult because how you set focus by yourself in a hotel room. I'm not in a hotel room today, but but a lot of times I was in a hotel room trying to figure out the focus and then I'd figure out where to sit. And then you'd always see me rocking back and forth when I really wanted to shorten that depth of field because I wanted to be in focus. Uh, and so, um, and people would, you know, I, I know that you would never think that our producers would send me discords, uh, telling me that I'm out of focus, but they, they do. <laughs> so anyway, I got that thing. problem right now. Yeah. So, so anyway, but, but yeah, what are you using right now? It's a Lumix G7, but it's a manual lens on here. So oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I do need the... to switch it to an auto. Cause it's like, just look, look at this. This is like, yeah, there's auto... no no room for play at all. Auto's kind of magical when it comes to what we do. You know, I think that having something that'll that'll stay in focus is is more important is important. Now, the other thing you can do with an, a manual lens, of course, is there are um, you can get motors for your manual lens, and then you can get a range finder for that manual lens. So Red Rock Micro makes those range finders as well as DJI. And then you, what you can do is that you put those on top of the camera, you calibrate it, and then it will take your manual and move it around. But it's cheaper probably to buy an autofocus lens, <laughs> but you can if you really are committed to a manual focus uh, or if you're getting a cine lens or something like that, or you get some old, uh, you know, K35 lens or something, which, by the way, K35 lens would probably look really good on Zoom. Anyway, so, um, uh, but but if you did, did one of those things, you might need to put those motors on there. Uh, next question. Coming in from uh, Craig McFarlane in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. He says, I need to record the isolated audio from a series of Zoom meetings, and I'm looking to Zoom ISO into GarageBand. Is there a better way? I go ahead, Richard. Is there a better way? What a lovely open question I to know. throw a lot of different options There's no at. budget on a better way. That's the best part is better way is just like, how could it be better? And there's so many <laughs> ways to make it better when we don't think about budget. Now we can, we'll, we'll, we'll do a little bit of, we'll give you a range. Go ahead, Richard. 
Yeah. So um, personally, I w- there's recording in Zoom itself as a backup. Um, g- recording from Zoom ISO into GarageBand is, is great. There's recording in Zoom as a backup, making sure that you've selected in the admin settings to record uh, individual uh, individual mics. There's recording on the other end uh, where you make sure that there's a system in place, um, either using different things like Audio Hijack to capture the audio on the other end for the person, even though Zoom says it's bringing dual recording. Um, and then there's what else can you bring into your Zoom ISO options? And that's where Dante into, you know, so from your Zoom ISO, maybe you've got multiple machines into Dante, into an X32 or larger console, into Logic, um, which is the system that we tend to use, which is, you know, with Zoom ISO, Dante into Logic. Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, I, I would say they're all the same things. Um, that, uh, But I, I just to be explicit about it is that um, there is, cloud recording the zoom cloud recording that you that you can do iso uh, audio and then there's local recording that can also do iso audio um and so there are times where i have i have just run a an instance uh, a windows instance in aws uh, a real small one and i'm able to get zoom running on it and it and then i start the recording and then i can um close that that window and now there's an instance that's running in the cloud that is recording i know it's got a good internet connection and it's just recording if i just want to know that i've got all those isolated audio tracks is a another way of doing it but i would still consider as richard is saying i would consider that a backup and that i would be going after a primary way of doing it and using zoom iso would be um, the way to do that go ahead chris Grant, are you saying that you're setting up that AWS instance to do a local record or a cloud record? Yes. Well, yeah, it's a local record. Um, I and see. it's and running a, local record it's running a cloud. cloud. Yeah, <laughs> my own cloud. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so it was my understanding. And I just want, actually, the reason I raised my hand is I wanted to remind uh, Craig that you really have to understand and spend, spend, spend a little time Saturday afternoon. Uh, reading through all the back-end options in Zoom. It took me a long time to realize that I could hit that little checkbox. You have to do it for the meeting, or I think you can do it for your whole account, Uh, but you have to do it, you have to hit that checkbox so that when you do a cloud recording, now Grant's telling me it works on a local recording too, when you do that cloud recording, that it will create a folder of stuff afterwards, and there'll be a file for each participant in the meeting. And uh, by and large, they sync up pretty well, um, but it works quite it works quite well. So, Grant, a local recording can have ISO files as well. Yeah. Uh, so, hold on. just in the this. Zoom, just straight up in the Zoom settings, um, recording, and then there's an option there: record separate audio file for each participant. And that this is just in the the standard client of Zoom. And it, and then you and then you'll need to enable local recording for for that um, for for that participant or attendee, and then away it goes. This is why office hours is so important because you get to meet Grant Whitehead. <laughs> and go ahead, Ronnie. Well, uh, what we do and, and what Craig didn't uh, identify was uh, the budget of this. Um, what we do is uh, we go out from um, Zoom ISO uh, out on Dante through our network into an Allen and Heath mixer where we do auto mix uh, in addition to sending out um, all the separate uh, channels in addition to the to the pre-mixed or, or automat mixed on the on the master and return that back out on the Dante and record it by one of the softwares uh, uh, recommended here in office hours, which is uh, Boom Recorder. And that never fails us. Has failed us once. <laughs> <laughs> for me, for me, <laughs> like, it was horrible. I go ahead, Jonas. So, since we were talking about backend switches, I just wanted to mention there also is a backend switch for recordings to make sure that you not have a timestamp on all of your recordings and the name of the person. The editors will thank you if you make sure that you have those disabled. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the um, uh, Dante to Boom Recorder is how is one of the ways we do it. We had some issues with the M1s specifically in Boom Recorder where it was, you know, the sample system wasn't working and it just created a crazy comb filter. Um, anyway, so that that is uh, one the one time that it hasn't worked, but we still use it every time we do a, do a record. 
Um, we also send via Dante, we send it to a Joko. Um, Joko is a, is a hardware solution that just is takes 64 channels of Dante and you hit a button and it's a piece of hardware and it records it. And that, that's something I've used for, you know, over a decade. They're about $4,500. So it's, it's, it's when you're serious about grabbing all the tracks and making sure that all the tracks are going to end up somewhere. Um, they're a pretty solid solution. Another thing to look at is also Audio Hijack. Um, you can take loopback, grab all those from Zoom ISO, send them to Audio Hijack and record them as individual, uh, as individual channels as well. So something to think about. Uh, next question. Coming in from my hometown, Los Angeles, Sean Callahan says, any recommendations for a low latency scalable streaming service that uses WebRTC as its primary transport? I go ahead, Jonas. There's multiple options. Generally speaking, when we talk about WebRTC for content delivery, there's two protocols that you need to be aware of. The one is WIP, which is uh, they add a HTTP component to um, the negotiation of the different uh, feeds. And that's the ingest protocol. And then there's the web protocol, uh, WHEP. And that is for the egress that is then being used, distributed to uh, clients. Then there's multiple factors where you need to be aware of, like how much uh, of a SaaS do you want? On the SaaS side, there is Dolby IO, which allows you to do web in, uh, ingestion. And then you can uh, build your own app out or your own CDN out based on their library. Then there's also Cloudflare Stream, which is one uh, that we look at because you can do web ingest and then do a web out uh, egress, egress and then put that into a browser. Um, it's pretty sick. On the totally cheap uh, scalable side, Twitch now also supports web input, which is really cool because now you can have a really low latency into Twitch and Twitch's latency already is pretty low. And then you can go on to build something with Oven Media Engine and or and Media Server. Then, but at that point, you're now building your own uh, CDN. And depending on what this is for and how many viewers you expect, um, that's quite the project to build the server infrastructure out yourself. But Oven Media Engine and and Media Server both have uh, features for WebRTC distribution. And what you're looking for is like an SFU, so a selective forwarding unit that makes sure that uh, this one stream originating from your encoder goes to all the different people and takes the load off of the one box that is sending the stream. So that should be a couple options. And depending on how development heavy you want to go, how much you want to deploy yourself, uh, that should give you a couple options. And and when you talk about scalable, when you're, when you're distributing to WebRTC, what would you consider the max number of people getting, WebRT, getting a WebRTC feed? With web, it is changed because like where WebRTC scale normally breaks down if it's like five to five people mm -hmm. and each normally for peer-to-peer -peer WebRTC, each of the peers needs to generate all the feeds for all the other peers because it doesn't reuse streams. Right. With a selective forwarding unit, which is similar, you can imagine it like the Zoom reflector. Yeah. Only one feed goes there and then it's just a question of how many SFUs you have, how many you want their scale wise. Um, and then it depends on like bandwidth and all that kind of thing. But you can scale it pretty well with those two protocols now. Yeah. And, and a lot of times the question is also how to, how, why you want to scale, you know, so uh, with, a, with a lot of services, what they've done is they do, well, this has been a couple years ago, but they would scale up to 200 people with WebRTC and then shift to HLS, like a low latency HLS after 200, because the 200 provided the interactivity that was required for the show. And the HLS was only a couple seconds behind and it didn't matter as much. Uh, and it would allow them to scale almost infinitely. Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, and if you if you didn't want to worry about all the server stuff, there's a little known uh, service called Zoom um, that uses WebRTC. Oh, I was hoping I'd get a spit take from Alex then. That was perfect <laughs> was timing. Like, I, I saw it coming. You. Well, you, you yeah, said little, nice. little known service, and I was like, I know exactly where he's going. <laughs> you could do a Zoom webinar, uh, and now you have a WebRTC stream. But do you know what? This is the thing is that, that you know, we, we have been using... Um, zoom like a live stream platform um and the and the difference is now that we want to be able to see faces like we want to be able to see the audience and it may not be all of them but you know so now we've uh, i think our highest concurrent um event now is about 40 it was about thirty nine and a half thousand people that we had all in zoom um and they were all able to have their cameras on 
And um, what happened is, from a live streaming point of view, is that we find that the audience is more engaged when they see other people that are engaged. And so when they can see the audience, um, there is something else that happens and it becomes more electric. And it's low, it's super low latency, right? It's working really well. Now, of course, there's lots that we have to do from a production point of view to be able to, to um, aggregate uh, lots of 1,000 maximum meetings because we're using Zoom meeting, not webinar. Um, and, but but we're finding it to, to be really good for um, if you really do need it to be low latency and you're thinking about live streaming, then, you know, there's systems available to be able to, to use Zoom to, to reach a huge audience like that. I, I will admit... I don't like to admit that I'm 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 sliding away from something, but I I will admit that Grant and and Blue are wearing me down on the whole, uh, you know, bringing people into the conversation. I think I've just sat through so many so many open mics at so many events where I just wanted the person to stop talking, that that I I became sensitive to it. But I was talking to I had a, I was talking yesterday to Daria Musk and. And we were talking about she went to a, I guess Jacob Collier. I don't know if people know who Jacob Collier is, but he's an incredibly talented musician that is one of the world masters at engaging the audience. You know, like he he plays the audience, like literally plays them like an instrument. Um, and if you ever, if you watch anything on YouTube, it's just it's magnificent. And um, he has like a little. You know, he has he has his own little Patreon thing that you can jump into, and he does it over Zoom, and he and he pops in. I think it's about once a month. He gives you almost no warning, and then he pops in. There's a couple hundred people there, and and Dario was talking about the fact that he was that he um, you know he plays a song, and then he's talking to people and everything else. But near the end, he started bringing people in. He's, he's answering questions through whatever he's using, and then and then he brings people in. And he said she said the whole thing just turns into popcorn, like people just really excited, and there's a lot of energy. And so so I'm trying to figure that out, but it's it's still it's one of those things that it, I think it works well, especially near the end. <laughs> We've got through a lot of the content. I'm I'm not I'm not ready to put it in the middle, but but I'm but the end uh, is I'm starting to kind of be worn down to uh, go ahead, Ronnie. Well, uh, I, I always see WebRTC as an uh, ingest uh, protocol, not a distribution protocol. Uh, so for, for me, it's uh, not natural to, to think of the, of the service uh, as using WebRTC yeah. for distribution. Well, and again, I, I think that there have been cases for it. You know, when, I, uh, when uh, Meerkat started, this is probably seven or eight years ago, um, I would put it... I uh, suction cupped it to a to a car while I was driving through Kigali, Rwanda, and I would just, you know, when I got to it, the, the, tra the traffic in the afternoon in Kigali, just in case you're wondering, is about four miles an hour, like, or, you know, <laughs> you know it's like two miles an hour, you're just kind of, and there's just like little, little motorcycles going between and you're just kind of almost parked. And so I would sit there and just talk about Rwanda while I was driving, you know, while I was sitting in there and, and the, the, that real time you know, uh, did make a difference there. I think that, but when, once you have a Q&A system like what we use here, I, for me, I find the latency doesn't matter as much and we can get through a lot more. A quick reminder, by the way, that you can ask questions. Um, and so if you want to ask questions for the first hour, uh, still a little bit more time for that. And then also for the second hour, if you've got questions about remote production. Also, as we get near the second, the second half of the day, or as we're in the second half, of the first hour, voting becomes more important. Um, definitely jump into Makana and vote those questions up or down. Let us know which ones are a priority for you. All right, let's go to the next question. Next one comes in from uh, Noonan, Georgia, and Tony Mobley says, please define Zoom ISO for all of your non-office hour members. Uh, go ahead, Jonas. So Zoom ISO allows us to take all of the signal boxes that you see in Zoom, all the different video feeds, and output them separately from each, from each other and only give you the video feed. So there's no name tag, there's no icons on it, there is nothing else on it, just the video that Zoom is getting. And it allows us to then build our own things on top again. So uh, if you, for example, see the gallery during this program, that allows us to pull the normal to not just overlay something on the gallery, but we're taking out all the feeds out of Zoom, putting it into our own hub, in this case, hardware, where we manipulate all of this. And suddenly you see this beautiful gallery that has even has rounded edges. And all that stuff is what we can do because we basically take the Zoom client apart, take all those simple video feeds out, put them into SDI, and assemble it to a graphic again. Yeah, go ahead, Grant. Yeah, I'll just take another stab at it, and that is that uh, if you think about the Zoom client, the way that, that we see it, 
um, Zoom ISO is a custom version of the Zoom client that is giving you direct access to the way that the video streams are coming in um, and the audio streams are coming into the client. It's giving you access to those and to be able to route them to where you want to do it. And the other thing is that almost all the things that you can do with a mouse and clicking, you can do with, with um, programmatically, you can do with commands over OSC as a protocol and you can control certain things and you can, uh, you can say what what video is going where, for example. And so now that becomes a very powerful production tool um, to be able to get video and audio and control where it's going, um, as well as things like chat and all of those things, um, you can also control programmatically. And so the, it's kind of opened a whole new world for, for us when we're playing around with Zoom. Next question. This one comes in from uh, John Richardson in... Uh... New York, Florida, I guess, uh, regarding all the over-the-top questions, does Vimeo provide a playout system and scheduler? Or what do you recommend to do the over-the-top live schedule? I love TVU's stuff, but that company seems to be imploding. I go ahead, Grant. Uh, possibly not quite answering your question, but, uh, but so, uh, Vimeo has added just recently a kind of web, web-based um, scheduling system you can actually take any vimeo um, video that you've uploaded now and stream it and it'll stream uh, through their servers and you can loop it and you can do all sorts of things um, streaming it's a new thing that they've added which means that you can take a bunch of videos schedule them out and now it will play it as a live stream without you having to broadcast to it now that's in the basic uh, vimeo package at, as far as OTT and potentially you might be trying to schedule a 24 seven live channel. Um, I, I don't believe they have that type of functionality in their service offering and that you would need to do that separately, but that, but it might be changing and they seem to be doing more and more web-based things. Yeah. One of the things that we're doing some research on right now is to, is to figure out how we want to do that for office hours. And so we take all the content that we've had in the past and have a 24 seven, you know, uh, cycle just kind of running all these shows. And there's a couple things that you, you have to think about when you think about a playout system. There is, I'm going to play from the top to the bottom, but then there's actual scheduling going, these are going to play at these times. You know, like a, so a broadcaster needs to know exactly when the, when the ads are going, uh, when, the, when the broadcast is going to start and end, and when all those things are going on. Um, and then you can have graphic inserts that happen in between those. So for instance, if you're always, if you're wondering why, the uh, the te the weather temperature uh, temperatures on the BBC at the end of every hour are different lengths. That's the spacer. <laughs> like it's, it, it, I don't know what it, I don't know what they use right now. They used to have a Mac Mini with quartz, and it would just it, it was just grabbing all that data and just throwing it up there, and it was just constantly running. So they could always just kind of cut to it and let it just fill out the hour. Um, you know, of of you know forty five seconds or fifteen seconds or or a minute. Sometimes it felt like three minutes. Anyway, so the um, but the but you you can build a scheduler into that system. Um, Avid makes a really big one um, that a lot of people use uh, on the Mac side. I don't know a lot of the PC side of solutions, but on the Mac side, um, there is Softron. Uh, we'll do that. Um, their their playout system does that very effectively, and that's what we're most likely going to use. But we'll see. And then the other one that that I know of on the Mac side is uh, on the air. So on the air is um, um, and uh, there's an Austrian team um, that makes that and the um, just play or just I think it's on the air just play I think is the one that they have there and um, those are two they're they're not cheap to get all the scheduling stuff they're anywhere from two or three thousand to ten ten grand to play off a little Mac Mini but they give you all those tools. Um, that it can grab. So you can have spacers that are going to RSS feeds that are grabbing temperature stuff off the web that are doing all the all little bits and pieces of those. And they're pretty complicated. And but that's how a lot of stations, those types of tools are how a lot of stations run those, um, those kind of auto playbacks is from a piece of hardware. I actually don't know of any, I mean, Jonas is probably gonna help us with this, but I don't know of ones that are full schedulers uh, in the cloud. Go ahead, Jonas. So scheduling wise, uh, a couple in the cloud. Avon does one. Then there is one from Nano Cosmos, I think what they're called. They build these schedulers. But what's interesting, there's like two different of channel, different type of channels. If you have a full VOD playout, um, you can scale it differently. You need less processing. You don't need to like re-encode everything. So there is Avon has a VOD to live technology where they use already standard 
HLS segments to resend them, and they have a general engine. It's open source. You can check it out on GitHub. It integrates into fast, and so like you can have all the integration together. Um, then that, and then there's these different little tools that build it, and then you can also build it on AWS. Use Media Live. With Media Live, you can schedule video playback that then goes into Media Package, or you can even put it into Media Tailor first because you want to serve ads and finance yourself that way. So like, there's a lot of options. I think if you want to save cost, you'll probably end up doing a little more development and you're probably going to kill the idea of having live content in the cup with playouts because that's more complex. But if it's just playouts, you should be able to go with one of those routes. Yeah, and that's one of the big advantages if you use something like Softron or or um, the Just Play products is that they you can just define a hole. So it's, it's going to go, I'm, I'm just going to be playing all of this stuff out, but at 7, this is what we're going to be trying to do with office hours is that from 7 to 9, the window will open and it'll go, we'll, we'll insert a live show and when we finish, it'll just go right back to VOD and it just has a live, you know, it's a window that it can just push live into and then immediately go back to what it was doing. Um, next question. comes in from uh, Alexander Knight in Vancouver, BC, he says, what happens when you pipe a 444 HDMI output into a 422-only ATEM camera switcher? Does it accept it and convert? Go ahead, Jonas. I'm going to need to channel my inner Mickey in here and say it depends. Because <laughs> on the ATEM, what's also important to keep in mind is when you talk 444, um, it... I think it should be able to do 444 YUV to 422 YUV. But where you're starting to get into issues, if you're then also doing a color conversion from RGB to YUV, and what to keep in mind with the eight minis is pod one uses a different HDMI chip that is less compatible with uh, those conversions. And then on the eight mini streams, it's uh, input one and two that uses a different HDMI chip that they use to do the direct out that you probably have seen on the HDMI outs. Good, Courtney. Uh, yeah, this is all usually depends on what the HDMI 444 is coming from. Uh, as a rule, HDMI has to negotiate with anything you connect it to uh, and negotiate the EDID. And they settle on the highest common denominator of, you know, all the video resolution, the video timing, chrom chroma chromaticity, chromaticity, color, <laughs> coordinates, and uh, video field rates. So it, they talk back and forth, and whichever one has the highest, if they're both versatile and can change their outputs, uh, whichever one has the highest available uh, resolution and I think gets wins and the other one has to conform to that one. Good. Go ahead, Alex. Hopefully I didn't get my terminology wrong. What, what I'm talking about is, um, for example, like if your HDMI output does 10 bit, right? So I know these, the ATEM minis are an eight bit switcher. So that's what I'm talking about. I don't know if that's the same as- Well, a, it's two different things. So so you can have, you can have 422. So 422 is the resolution of the color channels. So it means that you've got for every four pixels of, um, for every, so it's a, it's a resolution thing. So every for every four pixels of black and white, you have two pixels and two pixels of the UV of the of the color. Um, so that's a resolution problem. Whereas the bit depth, each one of those bits, each one of those pixels, could actually be ten bit or twelve bit imager imagery. So there's two different things there. So if you're sending a ten bit, I think it'll actually see it. If you're sending four four four, I don't think it will see it. Uh, I don't know that for sure, but I think that if you're four 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 at full scale is a different bandwidth, you know, so it's, you know, and so, um, and so I, I don't think it will, uh, I don't think the ATEM, we probably, it's hard to test because there's so few things that do 444 HDMI. HDMI is capable of 444, but there's almost nothing that does that. Um, and so it's really hard. Now, 10-bit is very common on HDMI. And so I would test that, but I think the 10-bit will probably go in just fine. Um, but I don't think that it'll, I don't think that the uh, ATEM Mini will accept 444 um, scaling. Next question. From uh, Douglas Carmichael says, Reddit is planning to cha uh, charge for API access. And Apollo, a popular iOS app, is already feeling the strain with an estimated $20 million per year charge to keep running. Thoughts? Go ahead, Jonas. I think what we're seeing right now is like a lot of people realizing how much stuff actually costs when VCs aren't paying for it. 
like we all would like to go back to VC paying for Uber, VC paying for APIs. Um, there is, I think it's going to be a test. And right now, when you say they are seeing strain, they aren't seeing any cost yet. They have talked about the cost and what it will be. There is likely to be enough backlash for that. But also, it might be intended to kill off third party clients that uh, replace your app. Because if you're not, because the one thing that Reddit has is all your data. And if you use a third party client that doesn't submit the data that they need to make the money with, they're less inclined to give uh, their data to the third party client. So I, I think it's a thing that we'll see more and more. And it's sad. I think that it's, you know, th third party tools that are accessing Reddit are kind of like scalpers. You know, they're not giving, and Reddit doesn't make any money off of that. They're just, they're just selling those, those tickets again <laughs> for their own profit. And I think that, you know, there's been a conversation around Reddit for a long time of they're generating an enormous amount of value that they're not able to uh, realize because all these other services are, are doing stuff with it. I think it's also aimed at, at uh, AI. So, you know, AI has been um, scrolling through Reddit for a long time, and it's produced a lot of content that AI is using for ChatGPT and other things like that, and um, and, and even MidJourney. And so I think that there, as the AI starts to scroll, I think Reddit looks at the opportunity to make a lot of money um, by having the AI bots feel like they need to be part of the Reddit uh, part process to um, keep their bots up to speed. So, um, so I think that I think it, I think it actually. I mean, financially, it makes sense for Reddit. I think it's a it's a, it's hard for people who have been using other things. As someone who's only used Reddit as the native uh, platform, I don't. It doesn't. I, I don't know. I don't even know what those features are that that come with the other ones. Um, but um, but I but I can see why Reddit would want to probably cut them out at some point. Um, next so question. Yeah, go ahead. Reddit is working on their IPO, and if you have let's say a thousand apps oh. already paying you. And now you say, oh yeah, we just increased the fees. We're estimating about 30% churn. We are messing X amount mm -hmm. of money. That's a really great story to start with. For an I mean, 10% of the API usage paid is worth, you know, the 10 X that non paid <laughs> if they're going, if they're going for an IPO. Absolutely. Uh, next question. From uh, Rian Smith in uh, Trinidad, West Indies. He says, hi team. What's a good video camera or camcorder that gives 1080p clean out via HDMI or directly to RTMP? That is sub $1,200 US for walking around for single cam live streaming, an event that trumps a DSRL rig. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead, DSLR Jonas. probably, yes. Yeah. I use GH5. Because a GH5 with its in-body stabilization, plus if you get a lens that also has inbuilt stabilization, is for walking around, perfect. Gets you a full-size HDMI. You can actually you have this little clip. You uh, bolt it into the camera to make sure that your full-size HDMI doesn't get loose. It's a perfect camera for a shoot type of that. You can put in your uh, power adapter. Gets out 9 volts. I, I built a custom like little P2 to um, that specific plug adapters, and I can run the camera for almost forever, it feels. Go, Jeffrey. So the camera that I'm talking into right now that I've used for many years for my uh, my on-site uh, uh, interviews and things like that is the Sony FDR AX700. Now that was a $1,600 camera. They do have a step down. It's the FDR AX43. And uh, that used to be $1,200. It's actually dropped down to around uh, 800 to $900. And I bet you you could even find it in a refresh uh, model on like Amazon for even less than that. So they'll get you. And, be do you know what the sensor size is on that Sony? Uh, I believe it was, yeah, I haven't, I haven't I thought about that. That's a one third inch chip. I think, it, I, think, yeah. I think it's a one third. I think it's one third. Um, those were before Sony started moving to the larger, I think it was the larger um, sensors. And what's the sensor size, Jonas, on the GH5? Is it, is it four thirds? One, yeah, one really quick. Felt. One what quick is thing is that they have a ref that, so I have an older version. There's a newer version of this camera and the AX43 as well. So, right, right, right. very good. Yeah, uh, Ronnie. Well, Jeffrey took my thunder, so then I had to pivot my uh, my answer uh, <laughs> and just support AX uh, AX53 is also really good. We used the AX700 for a long time, and what is a really killer feature of those cameras are the autofocus, uh, which is very programmable in in a good Sony way. So you can adjust it 
uh, to to uh, operate on on that level. But uh, we 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 can't forget the uh, iPhones. Uh, the cameras on those are very well, uh, and uh, and uh, the streaming from them are also very easy to do. And which the which AI, you said the AX? What was the fifty? I think it's the 53, um, and I think it's the same series as the 43 that Jeffrey mentioned. Yeah, and, and do you know what the and um, do you know what the 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 chip size is on those? I think it's one over. I think it's one over one third. So yeah, the, well, the, the the 43 I found is one over 2.5 inch. Almost one third. Yeah. Um, uh, next next question. Next one comes in from uh, Tim Holm in San Lorenzo, uh, California. It says, can you embed Vimeo streams into a website that is separate? Sorry, I have to rearrange my window here. Vimeo live stream into a website that is separate from the Vimeo service. Are there other choices that are competitive? I go ahead, Grant. Uh, yeah, there's a service that I've used a little called um, Daycast, Day. Um, D-A-C-A-S-T dot com. And uh, what I've really liked about them is that they use Akamai. Um, and so it's actually just a really easy way to get into using Akamai without having to have, you know, a kind of uh, enterprise or corporate account and all of that set up. Um, and, and they've got a few different plans and they give you the full access to um, the endpoints and your and you can do hls and yeah there's so it's it's worth looking into um as another option and i because i have actually found that uh, vimeo live streaming can just be a little glitchy at times um and people people find that uh i, I find that different people and they'll say i've got a great connection i'm hard hardwired mm -hmm. and i'm still getting it buffering um, and so I have found that from time to time. Yeah, hundred percent. Next question. Next one comes in from Alexander Knight again in British Columbia, Vancouver area. In an interview with actor Gates McFadden, she talked about barely being able to see her co-star Patrick Stewart on the set of the Picard season three due to the dark sets. Is this how they're trying to be cinematic? Go ahead, Alex. Just two quick comments. She said, one, when she got there, she asked, are we actually lit? And then two, she couldn't really see her co-star that she was trying to act with. And I thought that was really fascinating. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I imagine that, that there was something going on in that set that they were trying to make it look dark. And it used to be that you couldn't make it look dark. <laughs> the, the, the camera, you'd have to do that in post. And now that the cameras have gotten a lot more sensitive, you can actually shoot uh, a lot of these sets exactly the way you'd want them to be for the shoot. You're not having to uh, shoot them at a at a high rate uh, or at a bright area and then darken them down. You can actually shoot them. And so it's it's new for a lot of actors, especially ones that haven't you know um, necessarily done a, a ton of set work in the last couple of years um, but that's really changed over the last two or three years where they these these cameras are becoming much more sensitive the venice twos the aries and you can push them a lot further and and a lot of dps are pushing them personally i would light it more and then stop down but of course then that's going to increase your depth of field so they want that short depth of field they want it to be dark they want it to feel like you're there and that's what's i think creating kind of a and it's difficult for some of the actors um, we've gotten some feedback on some of the shows we worked on <laughs> the actors are like what are we doing here uh, it's usually actors that have that that did a lot of acting uh, more than 10 years ago um and, but uh, or more than five years ago um they they um it's a the sets have changed pretty dramatically go ahead courtney yeah you find actors that came from a live tell live tv where they're using you know television cameras instead of digital film cameras uh that are used to that you know 125 lumen uh, lit set yeah. uh that they, they're wondering about it. And and like you said, Alex, you hit it on the nose. A lot of DPs like the shallow depth of field for, as you said, the cinematic look. So they'll try and shoot wide open. It. And especially if they don't have very fast lenses, if they're trying to be in a zoom lens, uh, they'll open it as wide as they can. Uh, but they might have to pump a little more light in at that point. But these days they can find those super fast lenses, shoot them wide open and get that narrow, narrow depth of field. And all the first assistants hate them for it. And a lot of them, I, 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 I do feel like there's, you know, there's a thing called ND filters. That's what I'm using here, uh, you know, to, to make that all work too. So it's, it's a, you know, a, a lot of it is, yeah, it's an idiosyncratic thing with sometimes with DPs of they, they find a look that they, they're, they're good at 
they like a specific thing and they don't want to add the other things that they think take away from it. So when you hire that DP, you're making a lot of decisions about what that looks like. Also, the lighting package is a lot cheaper. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, in the old days, we shoot you know, day for night, which was weird because mm-hmm. you'd see this evening scene, but you'd look at the shadows in the background, you go, that's yeah. high noon. And look at those shadows that those trees are casting. The cameras are so amazing now, you can almost shoot uh, night for day. I, I think I've told the story before. We had, we had, when we were at the Rebel unit, we had uh, John Noel walked in, someone was like, I can't, I can't make this day shot look like a night shot. It was the, it was the Sith coming out of the back of the ship and it was supposed to be a, a, a night shot. And John was like, oh, you can totally do that. He, just, he went into After Effects, opened up the color correction and moved two sliders or three sliders, toot, 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 and it was, it was a night shot. And <laughs> the person that was there just said, command save. I don't know what he just did, but, but it worked. So, <laughs> All right, we are uh, now changing subjects to our second hour and talking about remote production. Um, we've got, wow, a lot of remote production experts here uh, for the show. So if you've got questions about it as we start to talk, go ahead and throw those into this, into the into Makana and get those questions in because um, it's a, it, it is an uh, incredible crew that we have here to talk about this in the second hour. And I'm going to let uh, Jonas kind of kick it off. And so if, if for the other panelists, if you've got things you want to bring up, go ahead and throw, raise your hand in the back end. And uh, Jonas, why don't you take it away and talk a little bit about um, how you're approaching remote production? Yeah, so first of all, I wanted to uh, give a quick overview of what even is remote production, because there's like, everybody has heard of like a use case and we we keep talking about it. But really, like, what does it mean? Um, so I prepped a slide here that you should see on screen any second now. And the, in its most basic form, remote production means not everything is in the same place. There is some part of your production pipeline that is not there. It might be people, it might be equipment, it might be something else. So um, we, let's see, um, what a slide. On the first slide, you see you one part of remote production is you have cameras on site. And you also have the processing for those cameras on site, and that can be like color correction, your CCUs, but also your switcher. And you don't backhaul all the camera feeds, but you only backhaul um, a multi-view. And then you remotely control, um, we remotely control that switcher. So that is one of the options. Um, the other option is you can backhaul all of those camera feeds. You might still have some processing on site, and remote production most of the time is a mixture between all of these uh, different options. So you have the two cameras on site, you backhaul them into your switcher, and you might as well have uh, the person that um, are doing it remotely on there. Then there's also the option that a lot of people call cloud production, the, but you can also do it in your own data center, in your own facility, where you backhaul all the camera feeds to a central point, I called it the hub, a cloud, and you still have remote people. So we do the same with office hours. We do it with the accidental theater. It's what cloud production mostly consists of. Um, yeah, so I wanted to go over a couple of examples of remote production we have done over the last um, couple months. So one of these was we needed to send multiple kits out for a Zoom production. So like where remote production starts for me is if we have equipment also at the person speaking, then it isn't just like a virtual production where we say, hey, join the Zoom call, but hey, we sent you out a kit. We send out a kit, then we use Zoom for back call, bring it all in the cloud, switch it there. But what is cool, since this is a remote production kit, is we have complete control over the little Insta360 they have. We have complete control over the lights, so they come with two lights, and we have complete control over the laptop. Um, what's even better is if there's any issue with the connectivity, we can also have um, use, we have SIM cards built into the laptops that we ship out. So we have out of bound management when they're like, oh, I can't find my Wi Fi passport or something like that. We can continue to set up and use that out of bound management. I have a little graphic here that shows, comes in a Pelican kit. There's instruction, it's like 10 to 20 minutes to build it. And then suddenly you have this remote kit, you turn it on. At that point, we tell all the speakers, hey, grab yourself like a glass of water. And while they do that, we dial in, set everything up. And when they come back, we hit a button and suddenly all the lights turn on. and We can set up the microphone and all that. 
Then a second example is at the start of this year, we did a little test with me going live from Barcelona where the processing also was completely in the cloud. But this time we backhauled four HD feeds into the cloud. We encoded them with H.265 into a quadrant. So we use about 7.5 Mbit. Um, what's cool is this is all on Epitherm Pearl Nano. So we use uh, two beacons, one of them sending 4K to the Nano, one of them we do an H, uh, 1080p pixel for pixel crop on the 4K signal. That's the close-up. And then we also use um, the 4K signal down converted to 1080p as a wide. And then I also used OBS on my laptop to stream an SRT signal to the Pearl. So we have a screen capture as well. Um, during that case, since we had, didn't have any connectivity and it was like in a different country I've never been to, we had one of our bonding routers with LTEs, and then we used the Paplink router to bond multiple LTE signals together and send it all up into the cloud. Of a bigger up for the four up. Then I have a third example. This was just recently. We did a live stream in the middle of nowhere, and we decided let's uh, do a remote production. So in this case, we had the switching on site, which was an uh, Epiphone Pearl Mini that then goes into the nano for encoding. So we had two cameras going into the mini. Those cameras were remotely switched. Um, but the problem was we thought we had the LTE signal there, but we hadn't. And there were so many people that also used Starlink that even stuck. I lost audio there. TP feed oh, there into into the cloud at like zero bits. And then we did some additional playouts in the cloud. And let's see, example four. This is where it gets a little more interesting. This was switched on site, but the camera operator was outside of the building. They were in a different part of town and we connected them through Cloudflare tunnels. Um, so we the TCP connections that is needed from the stock Canon controller to talk to the Canon cameras, we tunneled that through the Cloudflare tunnels. So the controller just thought it's local on the network. But the good thing with this approach is neither of them had to do like port forwarding, have a public IP address or anything like that. And me as a technician, we also tunneled out the web interface for those cameras into the web. So they were reachable on a website URL which would be dangerous if anyone can reach it. So we put Cloudflare access in front, which allows us to put like, hey, log in with your emails and only people with certain emails are allowed to see it. And then the last example doing Easter, I suddenly was sick and couldn't uh, mix my church's live stream sound. So one of the things we did is I have an X uh, touch bearing X touch here. We have mixing station locally on the church's laptop uh, PC. Mixing station connects to the mixer. And then I've written a little program that uh, talks to a, a proxy in Frankfurt. So no port forwarding again. And sends all the MIDI messages back and forth. And then there's just two loopback MIDI devices on the PC talking to mixing station. So like I had the whole control. I had audio meters. The faders were moving if someone else did a move. Um, what was a little crazy is it uh, 300,000 messages were And we're losing you there. This is the challenge with remote production: is that uh, we're all connected to the internet, and and uh, we're uh, uh, right now, Jonas, you're, we're losing you a little bit there. Uh, you might have come back. Can you hear us? Looks like. Do you have me back? We have you back now. It's great. The one time we don't do a remote production, we're like on site. On yeah, exactly. Land, even then. it's great. <laughs> That's that's great. Um, uh, I'm going to throw it to, to Jeff. Uh, Jeff also does I mean, uh, an incredible amount of, of remote production. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. How are how are you approaching this? I approach it a lot in the same ways that uh, that Jonas detailed out there, and uh, I, I do find it comical because I was on the ground in that time we did remote from our uh, our broadcast, and uh, Jonas, we had the same thing. It just you know it works great until we need to show it working great sometimes. <laughs> 
<laughs> it is one of those things we deal with on a, a continual basis, right? It's just part of the life. Uh, we're we're not using Cloudflare ourselves uh, as much. We're we're still playing around with it and still trying to find ways to use it. Uh, we're using the Peplink uh, ecosystem quite a bit to do our VPN and our our bonding uh, for for basic internet. But when it comes to actual distribution, we're doing different ways with live use um, uh, for their bonding uh, solution. And then, so we're not using the normal peplink internet for the actual encoding part. It's just going through the live use at most of our locations. Uh, but then whenever we have hard lines, we're using those and they're they're actually broken up multiple ways. Uh, so we have some redundancy around them too, uh, including Starlinks, including cellular. So there's, there's multiple levels of redundancy uh, played in our our goal was a little bit different it was it was one of the slides kind of a cross between the two of the slides actually so we're controlling switchers that are on the prim uh, or on the site from remote uh, we're controlling everything and not just switchers audio video you name it we're controlling it um so we're doing the switching remotely we're doing the the controls remotely we're painting cameras shading cameras doing that all remotely but we're either doing it from here and where I'm at now in, the, in our MCR, or we're doing it from uh, people's homes. Uh, we were doing this, you know, five six years ago, so it was well before we had to do it with uh, with the COVIDs and stuff. Um, but now most of our applications is we're trying to to bring people in to the MCR for for just continuity sake, mm -hmm. so we don't have these little dropouts and things like that that every once in a while could be a problem. We have fiber, redundant fiber here uh, with a gigabit either way that just makes things smoother. But, you know, lack of bandwidth is always, always one of the biggest challenges, whether it's on site or off site in the remote side, too. But our difference is we're controlling cameras, real cameras, re really moving, following sports with those cameras remotely and that's that's something that there's very few people in the business that are doing that uh over the robotic heads and everything because uh it's just it's hard to do it's not and, easy and are there challenges with latency in that area when you're, you're following all the sports? time and, yeah yes yeah, so that's all the, the time that's the thing right that's uh, the biggest challenge all mm -hmm. the time yeah. is is to be able to to mitigate that the best you can and every once in a while things just go awry and that's the but that's the beauty of the remote side and with us having our engineers on site we're like hey having a problem they take over and it's seamless right it's no problem yeah yeah and go ahead, jeffrey so i did i do my remote production just a little bit differently because i don't do live to youtube in in those cases most of the time a lot of times what we do is we take a field kit and we send it to a person and they unfortunately they have to set it up but we make it as easy as possible. We put it into a Pelican case that uh, that and, and instructions, they basically have two or three items that they have to set up and plug in. I think the hardest part is that 100 foot ethernet cable that, uh, go, that has to plug directly in the router. So we get at least a, a decent signal. And then, so for our remote production, basically what we do is we record to these to the camera so uh, in our case uh, I, i'd always we'd get the uh, android phones that did 4k or better and the idea is that they get a rig and i don't have the rig uh set up anymore but it's uh it's basically in a cage that had USB-C out that plugged through uh, directly via e Ethernet. It, everything was plugged in, so there was never a power issue. Uh, the audio was also piped in through this little dock that that we had for it, and so they would then record. What what they would do is they'd set it up. We'd uh, connect in via something like Team Viewer or something like that, and then we'd all get in on a Zoom call, and that laptop would be on the side there. Uh, they wouldn't they have an in-ear in so they could hear us and, and talk back and forth. So that'd be kind of like our comms situation there. But then they'd do their bit. They'd be looking straight at the camera, doing their bit, talking head type situation. And we'd be recording it right on the phone. When it was done, we would then transfer that file to uh, to a server, which can take a little while to do. So they have to have they have to know that they have to keep that camera up and running for a couple hours after the fact. So the files do get uploaded. And then that would take it to the editor. So we would then create uh, the shows after 
the recording. Uh, and then we'd always have the, we'd always be recording the Zoom call just so we know where all the pieces uh, went to go, especially if you get two or three people talking at that time. Uh, it was a lot of fun. There's a lot of juggling to it, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's a real cool challenge if you want to give that a try. You go, Grant. Yeah, just a couple of quick examples of things that we've been playing around with. One of them is to do with, with Zoom and I was saying before about having to uh, combine or aggregate lots of Zoom meetings together. And one of the things that we like doing is having all the chats and how many, in a and, page. And how many, uh, so you're, you say the, the highest number is about 39,000 or 40,000 people? Yeah, concurrence. A, concurrent. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. all in a meeting and you can get to any of them, right? So that's, and that's all happening in the cloud? Yeah. So that, yeah, that, that was with a couple of different locations as well, studios mm -hmm. that were, that were running them. And so right. we sort of had a, a main studio location right. um, that, that could easily um, uh, interact with people. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was sort of these other um, rebroadcasting studios that we were right. using um, as well to do it. But from a chat, chat point of view, um, you know, using Zoom OSC, um, I'm able to have a, bit, a little app that we, we call OmniChat, um, which is bringing all of the, the chats of all of those uh, meetings into one um, uh, web page, and now it just flows through. Um, the ex example of remote for that is is me um, controlling the couple of screens in the studio in in uh, Charleston, and so I'm just using log me in and and I can see those those screens and and I and I if I'm making little changes then I'm making those changes and it's super simple. It really makes no difference. Um, uh, if I was on site, I wouldn't be in the studio anyway. I'd be in a control room. Right. There's no difference um, with me being on the other side of the world. Um, so that's one one example. And the the other example was just this week in Australia, we just did a very basic little, um, unfortunately, hybrid event. Um, and uh, what 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 happened was um, we had some remote speakers, um, at, which seems to be happening with whatever live event, in person event we're doing. We we are having uh, remote speakers um, come in because for whatever reason they can't make it. It's now just because of COVID, it's now like, well, why can't I join via Zoom, you know? And yeah. so because of that, we have a couple of people that are remote and they're doing our tech checks and things with our speakers. But the other thing is that we, this is such a simple thing, but it's totally a remote production thing. And that is uh, the whole event that we had was, was typical death by PowerPoint type of event. And we had our stagetimer.io, huge fan of, of that product. Um, uh, we had our, a remote, um, tech was running the timer for the whole event. And so we had an audio op and a video op, and then no, neither of us were worrying about the timer at all. And there was just someone running the timer and it worked beautifully. And then at one point someone came to me and they said, oh, I'm sitting in the audience, but I, I need to know when I need to get up. So I grabbed an iPad, I logged into stage timer handed it to them and they went, oh, that's amazing. I've got my a, a remote timer. This is amazing. And I didn't have to worry about the timing at all. So I, I feel like from a remote production point of view, I think we can thank COVID for pushing us through uh, or, or pushing us maybe five years into the future. Um, 1F Jeff is a great example of obviously doing this stuff before COVID. Right. Um, and so we're, people were thinking about it for sure, but we, we actually have been pushed, I think, even more so to now, you know, typical production companies are thinking, oh, why don't we just have someone remote run that for us? You know, it's really cool. You know, I think that what's interesting is, is that the, uh, a lot of times if ingredients aren't all in the same place at the same time, things don't happen. You know, so if COVID had happened 10 years before it happened, we would have all gone back to normal as soon as it ended. The, what happened was, is all this tech, a bunch of us were already thinking about this and all this technology was, you know, uh, ready. So that when COVID hit, it, it wasn't perfect because it hadn't had that kind of pressure, but it was all ready to solve a lot of these problems pretty quickly. And, and now that it's done that, and now that we see acceleration in places like Zoom, and, um, and, and I think Zoom is really the only one that's doing like real production level tools, you know, to make this work. Um, that, that we're going to keep on seeing this. And I think that you're going to keep on seeing the need for more and more remote. I, you know, we were doing remote for CEOs and C-suite 
long before COVID, because for them to go, you know, for a CEO of a large company, like a Fortune 10 company, to go to Singapore, um, you know, to talk, uh, the um, that's really expensive. You know, that's a that's a private jet. Um, that is, you know, you're talking about, you know, so whatever the cost for us to connect them, it is a tenth or less of the cost for them to go. Um, and, and that doesn't count how much lost productivity when you have someone who's, you know, accountable for a trillion dollar company, you know, you don't want them, you know, dealing with jet lag, you know, and so, so figuring out a way to have them just appear where they need to appear, they can still have that FaceTime. Um, and so I think that that's, we're going to see that more and more. We were already doing it with, you know, um, Hangouts and, uh, Zoom and and sometimes fiber and, and so all those tools are allowing us to to take this to an entirely new level and I think you're going to see more and more. I'm speaking at Infocom um, uh, with Sam Pekaiko and and uh, I am uh, uh, I'm coming in remote <laughs> like Sam Sam is in the room but I'm not in the room. We did that last year. We're going to do it again. Uh, go ahead, Richard. Yeah, um, just like uh, just like Grant and Jeff and Jonas, um, we've done a number of different. You know, uh, styles of, of remote production. Um, there's so many interesting use cases for it. Um, our main case, which has been talked about quite a bit on, on Office Hours already, because it partially originated from Office Hours and all the team and people and help that we've got uh, from it, is our theater uh, being able to access teams and uh, from all around the world to to help on you know uh, weekly broadcasts. So we have people who are regularly um, controlling uh, cameras and lights and sound and uh, QLab playback and all these different kind of production elements um, on a regular basis through um, through different kind of systems to allow us to have one person say in the control room and then a whole um, not team, not staff, because it's voluntary, but a whole community of people um, connected and controlling equipment um, from Australia, from uh, from US, and, and so on, and so forth, and uh, UK. So, I mean, this is this is a huge leap into the future for us in, a, in an arts perspective. Um, one of my kind of favourite versions of, of this was um, last uh, last year. Uh, we there was a, an arts collective called Array who uh, wanted to do a production from um, a, a basically a field in the middle of uh, nowhere um, and we got to send out two cameras uh, two or three cameras into into a field uh, and uh, have them uh, perform this dawn kind of art installation in the middle of literally uh, nowhere with uh, it all running into a live view backpack and then coming back to me in the control room so we have this kind of interesting reverse uh, number of crew the more there's more crew on the ground than there is in the control room uh, for for this uh, and we have um, the you know the, team there to, to capture sound and then the cameras and it's all coming back for for me to confirm the signal so the the live view is sending back um individual camera feeds and then i'm able to switch it live from my end the crew don't have to worry about play out or graphics or you know the, the final signal connection i can i can do all of that but they can uh, focus upon the camera work or or moving between cameras uh, and, and that's a really interesting kind of use case um, uh, for, for us where uh, we can really raise the quality or actually achieve things that we would never have been able to achieve you know with an a10 mini sitting in a field um, uh, though we probably could have just about done it with a live view solo uh, it was nice having this whole other infrastructure that allowed us to do it to, to much higher quality and then there's kind of a, a more normal version which this is a, a live show that we did where literally it's just myself in studio uh, and then we have um, a presenter and Noam Chomsky uh, and around about a thousand people online watching it and then there's about 15,000 people have watched it uh, afterwards and it's myself in, a, in, in, the, in the studio doing the switching and doing uh, the the presenter prep and then Mickey remote um, all the way in the Philippines doing the sound uh, and helping us with 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 that element and then this is this huge kind of uh, kind of speaker that that we're able to to talk to and bring in for a conversation for a local festival again uh, but um, we're because we're not necessarily we're not necessarily sending them kit uh, in this instance because the festival didn't have uh, didn't have funding for that um, but uh, it allowed us to again reach this this huge kind of um, uh, um, uh, quality of production that we wouldn't have been able to do and I get to work with a really interesting audio mixer like like Mickey um, uh, who's all the way in the Philippines and I would have never have got to work with him otherwise. So that's a really interesting case for remote where we are really bringing that team down and uh, really making projects accessible especially for the 
arts, where the, the budget is, is usually quite tight. Um, for us, our normal productions look something like this, which is last night's production, where we have um, on hand, uh, literally, um, we have um, uh, Brian on uh, one camera, we have uh, JJ on another camera, and we have Kirsten, and I've got these cameras wrong, Kirsten, because she's always on camera too, apologies. Uh, and then we've got a fixed camera. Then we have a, a signed up, uh, Marty, who's in the actual building, and then Emma, who's controlling the switch and calling it. Uh, and that's all um, happening this on a, on a kind of weekly basis where we have this whole team of people, both remote and local to us, who are, who are really kind of engaged in both the artistic work that's happening. Um, they have a couple of really particularly uh, favourite shows. I'm not going to mention them on, on air. Uh, but you know, it's become a, a whole community aspect to it that, that this remote production is allowed to do beyond just the actual you know work and business and commercial side of it. Uh, this is whole accessibility thing that's really quite exciting. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Ronnie. Well, uh, I just wanted to mention a few of the things we have been playing with, uh, in addition to most of the other techniques that has been mentioned, and there's a few more. Uh, Blackmagic has an interesting thing on their production, uh, the version 2 cameras, where you can tether an iPhone, and in areas where you have good, good uh, 5G or, or 4G uh, coverage, you can just uh, stream directly from the camera through the iPhone uh, and go directly into a streaming bridge. Uh, and you even have uh, two-way communication with Intercom. Uh, another thing we've been toying with on, on remote kits is um, uh, iPad minis with the USB-C uh, connector and this uh, specific microphone from Shure, uh, which is also USB, um, and, and directly into that. And you have uh, headphones output on the microphone itself. Um, uh, on what one, microphone is that? Uh, that's the SM7B. Uh, Oh, you're using the SM7B into an iPad. Yeah. yeah. And you have two-way audio uh, into Zoom. And we also tried uh, the, the SRT app called Rivet from a New York company, uh, which has been uh, able to do recording. And we can just stream directly from that solution into, for instance, uh, vMix or OBS. Uh, with really high quality and local recording as well. So it depends if it's going to be live or if it's going to be uh, recorded. Uh, we have different solutions for that. And, and uh, of course, there are a little bit uh, playing with those, but they have been really, really solid when they are uh, uh, running. Let's go ahead. We got questions uh, stacking up. If you've got questions, uh, go ahead and throw them into Makana. Also, uh, vote on those questions to make sure we know which ones you want to, uh, us to ask. I don't know if we'll get to all of them because there are so many. But definitely ask questions if you have them and then vote on the questions that, uh, that uh, you see there already. Uh, go ahead, Jonas. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Next question. <laughs> all right. So this comes from Andy Kokendorfer from VR Florida. What are the most common failure points in a remote production system and how do you avoid them? Go ahead, Jonas. Communication between people is probably number one. It is really hard sometimes to communicate clearly with people. Um, it takes some skill to be able to walk someone through restarting your equipment when they are worried and like the client is breathing down their neck because the show just went offline and you need to restart the equipment now. Um, and then I would say loss of network and not having out of bound management for that and not having ways to restart your equipment. Um, I'm most of the time a continent at least away from our production equipment. So I'm not so worried about the latency because everything is latent to me anyhow. And, but it's most of the time it's losing access to the rack, having poor uh, internet quality. You might've noticed during the presentation how often I said without port, for port war forwarding, without like VPNs, without special access. Because that's all the things that we tried. And as soon as you get somewhere where you have 30 minutes to be ready, it doesn't work. Um, so that's most of the time the issues. And I really like having the out of bond management with Sims, like our peplings, even I could send them an SMS. Worst case, like if everything is got down, I can send my peplink an SMS to tell it, hey, it's time to reboot, or hey, please switch to this profile, which will bring you up to air, not ready, but I can at least dial in. Yeah, good. Good yeah, I'd also say about network or internet connectivity, particularly. Um, and I, I would just say that I, d I don't 
always think that bonding is the be all and end all of 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 connections. Um, I I was at an a, event recently where we, we were at a big convention center, and so we had a great fiber connection. It was a gigabit up and down, but yet they they wanted to bond it, and so of course we bonded it, and we're going through a, AWS, and so now we're up two hundred up and down. And now you're pushing up, you're pushing everything through that bonded connection, and of course it just kind of struggled every now and again um, because there was all these bottlenecks that were introduced, and so I I ended up saying, can you give me just a direct connection off of the fiber? Um, I'll be happier with that, and then I'll work out my own failover systems and backup systems rather than trying to bond it all. And uh, and there's places for bonding, absolutely. Um, and this was just one of those times that it didn't need to be bonded. So yeah. there's different ways of thinking about networking. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, th- I find with SRT, RTMP, a lot of those things, the bonding works really well. Uh, when we're talking about WebRTC, the jitter that is that, that comes with bonding oftentimes, uh, we, come, we get frames reordering, uh, which is a real challenge. Go ahead, Jeff. I would echo the same thing, actually. Uh, that's, that's one of the things we fight with the PEP links is, Though they can do bonding with their speed fusion product and all that, it's still not the perfect solution for everything, especially as I said earlier, I use LiveView with its bonding services just for outbound video out, audio and video out, whether it's one channel or four channels, it doesn't matter. It's still using its modems, its solution. It's separate from the network solution that we're using just for general connectivity. Besides that, I would say uh, of the most common failure points is definitely comms and and comms in two or three different ways. One, one, just regular comms, like we have Unity in our ear year. I mean, that may go out and then, but it's less likely that my comms over IP solutions go out because we we have a very easy way if we're running them on a phone, we could, you know, it easily just fall back to its cellular if you lose your Wi-Fi. Uh, but the other side of that is people get into a rut. I have a, a client I can't mention on air, but I have a client that insists that all the communications are WhatsApps. And I hate that because yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's just available on your phone or, or one uh, or whatever they call it, tethered computer. Yeah. And it's so frustrating because they're just, it's a bunch of just simple text messages back and forth that are not timely and then you miss them because you can't hear them and that that's probably the most common failure point i found in a lot of big events and they just insist on that oh no we'll just use whatsapp everybody has that but it doesn't work for production when we work with clients over and over again one one of the things that we've done is whether we're using uh, agent ic or unity uh, we get them to use it for every show no matter how complex it is and what happens is that first show is everyone's like i don't understand how this works and how do and i have a nice little pdf that I have of this is how you set this up. It's like six pages and, and I spent a lot of time on that PDF to make sure that it was very, and I've got a couple different ones that I use, but it's very clear and we have very little pushback. Like when people are understand how to, how to log in and how to put the stuff in that they need. Um, so whether it's Unity, and I have one for ClearCom and I have one for Unity and, um, and they get in there and they may not use it at all, but the next time they use it. And I try to get as many people into it as I can afford to put in there because um, I'm, I'm trying to get like, if we have 60 people that might, might not even be talking very much, I'll put them into a, their, own, uh, their own PL and I don't need them that, there that often. I don't need to interact with them, but I wanna make sure that they understand how to put it on so that when I need to talk to them, they've been installing this every single time and I do just enough communication with them to make it useful for them so that they'll keep on installing it. And that kind of just slowly kind of pushes that, that, that bulge out. Of, of startup where everyone kind of knows it. And what happens is it becomes a culture that you, people pinging us going, Hey, I'm going to be at that show. Can I get it? Can I get a unity login? Or can I get this? You know, cause they know that that's, that's one of the things that needs to happen. And, uh, and everyone tells them, you know, after that, after a while, they're like, Oh, you just need to get on unity. And then that'll be, you know, or, or I go so far on. as to give it away. I don't even line out of it oh, anymore. No, I just no, give I it away. I uh, just here, use, we'll use our system. Oh, but yeah. I even have those clients. I had, there are certain clients, right? Well, you know, that's just a lot of trouble to go through. We'll just, we'll just use WhatsApp instead. I yeah. Like, and I, I have to admit that I use kind of very subtle digs, you know, just like, well, as we move to a modern, a modern production system, you know, usually we need to have additional PLs to, to make that, um, to modernize the process and allow it and give us the, and, and, and then I'll tell you right now that anytime something goes wrong, like I've had the same problem that you've had, which is they want to use messages, they want to use unity or whatever. And I throw it under the bus 
at every moment. Like, like, oh, we couldn't get in contact. You know, a lot of times the PL makes it easier for us to respond to that faster. Uh, we might want to think about that in the future. And I just keep on just, it's just, it's not, it's not like a, a full on attack. It's just like little, little, little jabs all the time. And you slowly bleed them out. <laughs> Good Ronnie. Uh, one of the most, uh, experience failures is uh, network and capacity and especially on uh, asymmetric lines uh, where the client is uh, telling us to we, we have enough uh, bandwidth we have like uh, yeah. uh, 20 or 50 megabits but that is down and it's yeah. often asymmetric and that yeah. that you have to have a, a speed test going both ways and uh, have them send it to you you go richard yeah, I completely agree with uh, with everything that uh, Jonas and uh, and Grant and Jeff and Ronnie have said. Um, but for me, it's logistics um, is one of the key things. Just that level of starting to plan and work through the production to find out what you're missing. When does it need to get to the place? What's the backup when it doesn't get to the place? What's your backup when your connection isn't going to work? What's the backup to the backup? Yeah, it's those level of logistics, just sitting down, slowly planning it. And experience is, is the key for that. Um, um, uh, to, to start to learn how to communicate with people across different countries in different time zones and understand how to, to make sure that things are ready and they're on time uh, and, uh, uh, and not waiting around and you're not wasting people's time. That for, on the voluntary side, that's one of the key things I try and uh, try and uh, hammer in as much as I can into myself to try and get it right. Um, that for me is one of those kind of things that often lets things down more than even the tech. Absolutely. Next question. Next question comes from Bo Cordell in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. He goes, what is the minimal viable AWS instance type that can be reliably run an instance of Zoom or Zoom OSC? Go ahead, Jonas. So I'm really interested what Jeff is about to say, what his minimum instance is. But you can technically run it on a T3 small. You won't get any good frames out of it. You won't get good control signals out of it. Um, we have found um, the money saving isn't worth going much lower than a C5 large. Um, that's where we have settled. Open, we're losing your bandwidth again there. It's, it's always That's how they always get you there. Jeff, go ahead. I, I was going to echo exactly probably what Jonas was going to say is C5s. We we rolled back to those. We were using G4s, so G4DNs, uh, which are pretty available uh, now. But for a while there, we had a, a, a big scare whenever it was more affordable to run uh, the, the Bitcoin uh, mining and all the different uh, mining things that were happening with the graphics cards. That was happening in the cloud. And so they used, this is a theory, is that they used up a lot of the G4s. And so we couldn't get those. But a G4DN uh 2x large I, I go a little bit higher the 2x has more cpu power and thus gives you a full 1080 if you have the resolution set so you need to set the resolution of the desktop also and the g4 allows you to do that so it needs to be 1920 by 1080 is what we found and then uh if we were we were able to make it work but i like having the g4 because i can run a studio india studio monitor on it and use that and its tools uh, a little bit more uh whereas the C5, you cannot run a uh, studio monitor because it's missing some of the uh, uh, instruction sets. So for us, it's either a C5 uh, 2X still, or it's the G4 2X. I'd oh, rather yeah. err on the higher side. Right. I just yeah. wanted to give a tiny little trick. Um, so we found this little trick how you can run a studio monitor on a C5. You download, there's a Mesa emulation driver that you download. You take the DLL, you put it next to the exe off the studio monitor and you never regret uh regret it again it's great we have that's why we were able to use c5x largest um what's also important is we found a g4dn x large is enough for zoom's native client to do 1080 but as soon as you have a zoom room you will need a g4dn 2x large at least go ahead grant uh, yeah, so it depends on on what you're doing, right? So the, the the boys are talking about doing some heavier graphics lifting. Um, I've been really successful um, just needing to do uh, from Zoom breakout rooms to Unity relaying, right? So I just I have a bunch of breakout rooms, got a whole heap of things that are going on, and I want to be able to access them in in PLs within Unity. And so it simply is some instances running in the cloud that has Zoom and Unity running and and 
basically, you know, looping um, to be able to go in and out of, of Unity. And I've done that on T2 and T3 smalls, three cents an hour, um, and they've worked really well, you know, like perfectly. So I can I can run them and run them for a five-day event, and, uh, and it works great. So you, you can certainly do it, but of, of course I'm not doing anything graphics heavy, and I tend to use Chrome Remote Desktop for that, um, install that on the on those instances, and now I can um, access them for, you know, for free. You know, using the right. remote desktop and works great. Next question. Uh, next question comes from uh, Joe Floyd uh, from. I think that. Anyway, uh, Joe Floyd is going. Gainesville. Gainesville. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I can't read that for some reason. How are you currently pricing kits for remote VIPs? I go ahead, Jonas. It depends on how important they are. If they're really important, I would say, hey, let's let us send out someone to a nice uh, we work to an office, to a studio we can rent and we'll bring them there because they probably don't want us in their home. Um, and then we just build the kits to order. So like we have our smaller kits with an Insta 360 that are ready to ship at any notice that we can ship that are easy to build but then you can also go up to like in bgh1 and a little motorized head and all that but then it, it really depends like sometimes a vip is like an exec from a bank but you're a really small organization so if you send them a big kit, they're going to be like yeah what do you want like you're already not paying me for the 30 minutes i'm here now i should build this huge thing so it, it really depends on the situation on what type of kit you need yeah, I know for us, um, they, they range from $500 basic kits. Um, the, the, the basic one with, with computer and lights and mics and so on and so forth run at about $2,500 uh, per person. And that includes the shipping. That's kind of a rough rough estimate. The, the, these are all kind of uh, a range. And then when you have the specials that are eight to 15000 you know, and these are, uh, you know, these are building basically small studios in, their, in somebody's house or in a house next to them. And again, oftentimes we, we VBRO is, is our friend as well as, um, or in the past has been our friend um, of where we uh, get houses oftentimes in the community, but not necessarily in their house. It looks like their house. Uh, it gives us a lot more time to set up and all they have to do is walk in and we have lunch in the kitchen and <laughs> everything's all set up and they just walk in and do their thing. And it's a really comfortable way to leave. And it's actually not that expensive to do. You, you do have to be careful of uh, in the VBRO, what the releases are, whether you're allowed to use video cameras and so on and so forth, that's not uh, a given uh, with uh, Airbnb or VBRO that, that the uh, owner will be okay with uh, having video cameras in the, in, the, in the space. You have to pay attention to that. Next question. Next question comes from John Nichols of Concord, California. He goes, have you run Zoom ISO in AWS? Can you talk about any gotchas or constraints? I'm trying to record the ISO outputs uh, somewhere vmix at the moment and getting dropped frames using ndi any advice uh go ahead Jonas. well the biggest gotcha is it's it's a pain to stop like it's really interesting if you read the page on uh, mac instances in aws they mentioned oh yeah you can start it within three minutes and then really small they say well stopping is gonna take at least an hour we're definitely gonna bill you for it oh and you can't stop it within 24 hours after starting it so that's like the basics you need to be aware of you can't stop it for 24 hours as soon as you started it. A restart takes one to two hours because they need to completely wipe the drive of the Mac Mini again before they image it again. Um, make sure it's in the same availability zone than where your vMix is receiving because otherwise you'll have more costs there. And then also we have found that if you're saying you don't visually see the frames drop, but you see it in the little um, VMAX drop down where it says how many frames it dropped, we found you can sometimes can just ignore that, especially with weird things like cloud and a Mac mini that goes through like a specialized Thunderbolt adapter that then gets virtualized and all that. Um, there are the constraints we have found is they are just really annoying to build all the Zoom ISO instances and the Mac mini instances and then, yeah. But Zoom ISO surprisingly is typically fine with the licensing. That's an issue you have often if you have swapping hardware. So keep in mind if you have install another program that isn't Zoom ISO and you need to uh, have that on all your instances, if you stop it and start it again, it's gonna get a new serial ID because um, 
it's less virtualized for the Mac minis than it is with the normal Windows and Linux boxes on AWS. And, and would you say that if you have less than four people, you would just still use Zoom rooms? Other than we are still myself. using Zoom rooms just for like the convenience and like yeah. remote controlling it. Because one of the things is uh, since Zoom ISO is only being able to co be controlled through OSC, then you have this whole pain because OSC isn't bidirectional, where you not only need, does your VPN be like you now need a side to side VPN to all your operators if they want to have the companion that controls Zoom ISO locally. Um, we have found it easier to give them the web page for the Zoom Rooms controller. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hey, go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, I've been playing with this a lot because uh, I want to do ISOs uh, for a lot of my cameras here, even in the studio. Uh, so with with vMix, actually, vMix is probably your best choice for software switching to do ISO recording because I found that Wirecast doesn't do graphic Record isn't using the graphics card for the uh, or GPU for the uh, for the recording of ISOs and OBS. Uh, OBS can do it with a third party plugin, but once again, it's not utilizing the GPU for that. And then, of course, trying to do it on a Mac, you're 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 dealing with uh, the silicon GPU side, which can be problematic on its own. Uh, so the biggest thing is make sure that you have enough cores in your machine, that you have enough graphics, the, the right uh, GPU in your machine. And then always, if you can record to more than one drive on different USB or different type of bus, then you'll have a better chance of not dropping any frames. Next question. Next question comes from Grant Whitehead from uh, Adelaide, and he goes, what considerations should I think of when setting up a remote-only live streaming control rack? Assume no physical access at all. Go ahead, Jonas. Make sure you have a way to remotely um, kill the power and start it again, because we all know that's like the most annoying thing that somehow always still seems to work. Make sure you have out-of-bound management. So... If your company decides, hey, you know what? Actually, I think uh, we're blocking the port that you're using for your VPN connection now because we had a security incident. You can't really drive there. So like we always have an LTE that it then fails over to and then you can get in and see, oh, actually they are blocking you and they're going to tell you they don't block you. Then send them the lock and suddenly they don't block you again. So keep that in mind. Uh, if it's something that is used commonly, make sure that you have something like uptime robot pinging it and making sure it's still there. So if you arrive there an hour before the show, you're like, hey, let's get everything ready. And you're like, yeah, my bandwidth is low. Everything is low. The, all the PCs have failed. The Mac Mini is full with uh, RAM and doesn't want to restart. Um, keep that also in mind. And then, yeah, being able to have power sockets that you can remotely restart that should be part of your out of band management because ideally you also restart your router. So keep that in mind and then, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, ditto on uh, what Jonas was saying. Um, for me, the num number one pain point often uh, with managing our rack remotely is just that if something stops working, you can't get the signal back that you ha we have a way to reroute around it. Um, so having a backup or a different way of routing a different signal, so video hubs or kind of if it's phys physical signals or extra computers, if it's a, if it's more uh, video over IP, but just different ways of rerouting signals when something dies and you just can't restart it or can't change the ca uh, the cable port on it um that that that's one of our kind of main power points or the pain points yeah go ahead jeff back up definitely on the on the internet side that's the redundancy there and then uh, as uh jonas has said several times out of band so so just to define that a little bit closer for those that don't actually understand what that comment means that means it's not your production network so it's not your production internet so if they give you a fiber line like grant was saying he had it, they would still have a out of band so something that's not connecting through that line access to a router uh like a pep link like we use we could come in through the sim card instead of having to depend on that fiber connection to be able to get to that remote rack that's probably one of the biggest changes we've done in our workflows it just i i don't care that that, that router already has 12 volts in our systems or, or 12 volts power so it's running off of a huge backup battery in our trucks so it's always running so i always have access to my rack if and as soon as the rack is on and the regular fiber is powered up, 
like a fiber or a cable modem or something like that, then I have that bigger bandwidth, but I always have my cellular backup out of band. Yeah. And, and one of the things that uh, we really look at almost everything, every piece of hardware is can this hardware be uh, remotely controlled? And even down to the PDU, uh, network-based uh, PDUs, on the, the power distribution, um, allow you to turn off each uh, outlet at a time. So it's not just so you can see what the draws are across it, but you can also say, I want to turn off outlet four, which, you know, hopefully is the right piece of hardware that you're trying to reset. Um, but uh, <laughs> we, we, we haven't gotten that right sometimes. Someone changed something, they plugged it in and you, and, and you, uh, it wasn't during the show, but it was during rehearsal and, and we turned the encoders off instead of the router. Uh, yeah. So anyway, so the, um, uh, so the, the, you do want to keep track of what those are. But one of the things that we, you know, for the remote racks that, that we built for Pixel Core, uh, we had Meraki's in all of them. They were all part of a network as soon as they lit up and we could see them even before, I mean, if they plugged into the internet, if they had any internet, we could find them, you know, and and then we could start to mm -hmm. configure things and so on and so forth. And so the the Meraki system, I, I know there's a lot of other options, and it's the it's the most expensive version of this, um, but it was very very effective at basically all of the equipment was all we we set, let, left everything at DHCP, and the Meraki's mm -hmm. just knew what you know based on the MAC addresses they were all programmed. So you, I just said, give me what what kit are you in? And someone would say, oh, I'm in kit four. Well, I know everything is going to be the same except for the except for that subnet. Um, and so, and, and, and the switcher's are always going to be in the same place. The routers are all in the same place. The hyperdecks are all in the same place. And that mm -hmm. was just plug and play. And we could plug anything in there. We could replace one and then they'd all be in the right place. And so, so that was really, really useful for, you know, for what we did. And it's, what's amazing now is that we've gotten to a point where we don't even think about it that much anymore. Like it's, it is a, you know, like you wouldn't, it, it was cutting edge when we started doing that 10 years ago. And now we don't, you know, it's not a, not a big deal. Yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. I thought of something when you were saying about making sure the right thing is plugged into the right hole that might actually be unplugged or turned off. Yeah. Not only label it, color code it so yeah. that if it's a, a PDU with six plugs, it's all six are different colors. And hopefully yeah. the person you send to do the, the monkey it, you send is color, not colorblind. Yeah. So they know which one to grab. It's you know, the funny thing is, is that we, we, uh, uh, people make fun of me because I, I make, a, I use a lot of color when I, cable things, but I'm like, wow, I can have a pack of cables that are tied together and I can just follow it, you know, along if I, if I use them. And the most popular for me is using resistor codes. So, so if you talk about a PDU, I will go black, brown, red, orange, yellow, you know, like I'll just, you know, just go down so that I, I just say, what color is in that one? And they say red. And I know that that's going to be number three. Uh, next question. All right. Next question comes from uh, Steve Uroff in Madison, Wisconsin. Go Badgers. Uh, what is your opinion on using live network bonding for events? Gain the re redundancy if a link fails, but at risk of adding jitter and latency. Go, Jonas. So it's amazing when you're aware that bonding can't surpass our physical limits. So if you have two feeds and one of them is at 100 milliseconds of latency and one is at 10, you won't get magically a feed that is at 50 milliseconds of latency that has the bandwidth of both. If you want both, you're going to need to be at a latency that's at least higher than your highest lag. We found the peplings are really great if they're bonding the same type of medium. So bonding three SIM cards, two SIM cards, and then having... Um, so what we do in peplink, you can have uh, uh, connections that are bonded. And then if those two fail, you can also have a connection that's a failover. So what we often have is we have... Let's say you have a fiber connection like Grant said. What we would set up is the fiber is tier one, and then there's a failover to a bonded LTE. And like this is one of my favorite things because most things can only fail over from one connectivity to the next. We can fail over from it's like we could even you can even do it without the speed fusion. So you say first you are just on fiber. If that becomes unavailable, you fail over to speed fusion hub, which like would reroute a bunch of things with cause a little bit of a turmoil for your things. But yeah, keep in mind there are physical limits to how packets can fly. And then like, like SRT has a bandwidth smoothing, mm -hmm. the same way that Peplink has bandwidth smoothing. So if you need a smooth uh, van, you can activate it, but then suddenly you need more packets because they make sure they're getting retransmitted. So like that's almost always a trade-off. 
But in general, as like a rule of thumb, if you have the same medium with similar latencies, because like even a SIM card, we have some that have 20 milliseconds latency and some that have 250 milliseconds of latency because they get backhauled to Germany first before they get used. So make sure you're in the similar latency range. Ronnie. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. I was going to say almost everything that Jonas said. Also, we 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 our minds are in two different or, or the same places. Uh, the only thing different is network. As I said before, network bonding and outgoing bonding I keep separate. So if I need bonding, in a, if I'm in a situation that I need a signal to make it no matter what, and I want bonding involved. I use a tool such as LRT, which is across LiveView, or I might even use a DiGiorno or a uh, Avi West, or on the far end, maybe a TVU. That is a video signal into a box that just does that one thing. So I'm not using internet through that box. Uh, though some of them can do it, I don't. they don't do it well, and there's more latency involved in that. So I keep those separate if I need bonding. If I want bonding for redundancy, that's a different process just as Jonas illustrated. And I know for, for me, we, we don't, uh, Zoom is the, the most latent thing that we use uh, when, when someone says they want real-time communication. So at about, at about 150 to 200 milliseconds a leg, that's as far as we're gonna go. Um, you know, and, and then after that, we start you know, implying fiber, you know, private fiber and other things that, that are gonna allow us to, you know, um, to, to build that out. Once we go over that, we're like, well, you're not doing interaction. I mean, that's the way we, that's the way I approach it. So now we'll just turn the buffer up, <laughs> you know, like and make sure that we've got lots of extra bits to make sure it gets out of the, out of the building. Uh, next question. Next question from Madison, Wisconsin of Madison, Indiana and Roscoe Jones asking, how has the pandemic normalized remote production for business or has it been the advance of remote technologies like AWS and Zoom driving down costs? There you go, Jonas. It gave us an endpoint to say, I know you don't like it, but this is the requirement that we need to do right now. And then people got comfortable with it and suddenly they're like, oh, actually, it's not that bad. We can use it. Um, I think I think you're right. I think it's what's interesting is, is just kind of force fed everybody like you're, you don't have any. I don't think this would have ever happened if you didn't get to a point where no one had any choices. Like no one could say that, the, you know, and, and there were a lot of failures, but I think there was enough successes. And what I think we're doing is really going forward and then we're backing up because people really want to go back to the way event producers really want to go back to the way it was. And then and then it's slowly going to take over. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. I would say it's it's familiarity. It became more familiar to people, mm -hmm. so they're not near as scared about it. But they're still scared. I guarantee you, they're still scared. Even There's a producers, lot of and the uh, producers, but also clients too, mm -hmm. uh, because they're they're like, oh well, we'll have a different conversation one time, Alex, about mm -hmm. one of our close friends that was about it and they were doing a show and I'm like, why don't you just shade it and run the cameras remotely? He goes, no, the client wants it there. Yeah, they want yeah, people yeah. there. And so yeah. sometimes the client is the one that wins. Yep. For now. Oh, go ahead, Grant. I mean, the, the problem is, is that what happens always is the clients come back and they go, I don't have the money or I can't do this thing. And then that's when you pounce on it and go, and okay, that's when well, you give them it. the option. Here's, here's the, the option. Here, here's the option that's going to be less expensive or more effective or more flexible. And this is how we get them in. And it's, and you, you don't try to, for, I don't try to force anyone to do anything. I just sit there and I just, I keep on feeding like this is the stuff that you may want to think about um, to kind of have them come over to that and let them do it on their own pace. Uh, go ahead, Grant. Just to the point about driving down costs, I, like the Zoom costs are incredible. Um, how low it is for yeah. what for what we're able to do. I mean, you think about after hours that we just run round the clock. You know, yeah. multiple feeds in and out, going ten eighty. And um, now the thing is, the the reason that it's that it's so low, the cost is so low, is that it's the the huge services of of enterprise and education. You think of some of those university sites that have huge amount, huge licenses for Zoom. All of that is offsetting our costs, right? When we come in and and have a small, maybe a small account, and we're running it twenty four seven, um, that there's no way that it, just from a bandwidth point of view, that our our subscription fee is paying for the bandwidth alone, um, and it only works because it's a huge company that's being that's offset by all these other 
um, services. And a way that we know that is is by is by um, products like Zoom Video. When you look at how much Zoom Video costs, like their their transport layer, yeah. um, it's quite expensive. We, and we did the you, math. You compare it. it. Yeah, we did the math one time. Math. It, it, the office hours, not after hours, just office hours. We the math was fifty six thousand dollars a year a, a month. Fifty six thousand dollars a month is what it would cost for us to do this every single day, uh, the way we did it. And that's when we realized we get a pretty good deal for out, out of Zoom. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Jonas. Yeah, and like what's interesting is the cost was what stayed after the fact, but now it's also operator comfort, like. It's so nice after a long show to say, hey, you know what? Let's shut all the instances down. Let's just shut it down and no walk the, the 20 meters to your bed or something. And it's like, no, no load out. It's so great. <laughs> and like our oh, operators love it. I found like them being at home or like and not having to travel, like obviously you save the travel rate, but also they're just like way more relaxed. They're less on edge and like a little more at ease is what we found. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it's, I, you know, and I think that we're just going to continue to see this grow. You know, it, it's not something that it's, it's not going away. And the problem is, is that the math is on our side. It's just as, as the tools get better, the, the expense is going to be, it's not going to line up at all. And you have, as you get, make it better, less and less people, like as soon as someone has a setup that's similar to what I have, uh, as soon as we find that as soon as an executive has this, they don't want to go anywhere. Like, you know, when they're doing it with their laptops and they look bad and they sound bad and they see it later and they go, oh, I don't want to do that anymore. Um, they're, they're very hesitant. But as soon as an executive has a Super 35 or bigger uh, sensor, uh, they have a thing, they have good lighting, they have good audio, they immediately stop traveling. Like, it's just, it, it, it's, you know, because they, they just can't, they can't justify it anymore. Um, so it's just a matter. And we're, see, you know, the the most uh, forward thinking executives that we've built studios for, it's right next to their office. So there's a room that's oftentimes anywhere from 15 by 15 feet to 20 or 30 by 30 feet. There's a full on production room next to it. They're gonna walk in, that's where they do their, and, and that is, it's next, you know, and they almost never show up in person anymore. Like as soon as they have that studio next to them, it, they look better there than they look in person. They have more information ahead of them because a lot of times they're sitting there at a, at a town hall and they've got like eight screens in front of them with notes from their other executives. They've got feedback, the next question, uh, you know, all these things that are sitting up in front of them. And that's that digital first experience that, you're, that we're slowly moving towards is I can give a speaker an array of information, not just the people that they're talking to, but all the stuff around it. And then they say they appear much smarter. <laughs> and when they, as soon as they, as soon as they crest over that edge, uh, it is over. Like it, 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 you know, like they just don't want to play, you know, they're just like, okay, this is all, um, you know, this, this is all they want to do. Um, because it's just, it's so much more comfortable and they don't have to travel and they don't have to lose all that time and everything else. So I think we're going to, I think that we just know that the, you know, the future is on our side. The math is on our side. The experience is on our side. And there's just people with old thinking that are going to take a little longer to persuade. <laughs> so that's, yeah. But, but they don't, they don't have, they don't have any, they don't have, they have very little, uh, leverage to kind of push it. You were going to say something, Jonas. And what's interesting is what you're saying about the exec is also true for my operators. Like when I get called on site to be an engineer there, I'm like, okay, yeah, can I have four monitors, all my monitoring tools, yeah. being able to pull down multiple SRT feeds and like right now having yeah. opened a threat map that shows me how many attacks are going from Germany to the US who are congesting my bandwidth and can I have all that I mean, on site? And the answer mostly is no. And I'm like, yeah, let me just sit here. I can do it yeah. from here. And I have I mean, to I, most of the shows that I work on, I don't, I don't, I'm not on site. I'm at a control room looking at everything and we, we've got scopes. I've got multiple monitors. I've got things I can turn on and off. I've got all the speakers opened. I've got, you know, everything's is all there and it's all built around that. And I'm not, I'm not there because, and I, I try to explain to people, even if you took the room that I'm in and put it on site, it would be less effective than if I'm just sitting here quiet, disconnected more like the viewer and being able to see it from that vantage point of not, not knowing or feeling what's on the ground. Go ahead, Jeff. Last thing. Oh, can't hear you, Jeff. Hardware button. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, what I was going to say is that so much of our, our familiarity too, is like, I I'm used to having so many monitors. I'm sitting on my MCR here. I actually like it better than my desk, even though I have two big 4K, 43 inches. Yeah. But now I've got 16 here. I can see everything I want to see. I yeah. have 
two different live shows that are setting up right now. I see their signals popping up and everything is just coming to life and it's just more information. And I, I can't see doing it any other way. And, and it's funny because when you get the comms right and you get and you wire those comms in, so they're back into the Dante system on the ground and they're and they're everything else. It's amazing because you'll have someone sit up there and I just push a button and go, "Hey, Frank, uh, we're going to be starting here in a couple of minutes." And can you, you know, we just want to make sure that the next time you do that, you don't look down over here and make sure that you know, do you have, are you having any issues with that? And and they'll, they'll they'll always be this like, "Where are you?" I'm like, "I'm just a little north of San Francisco." And and then there's like this pause of like, "What is going on here?" You know, and so. Um, but it, it really, and we've had, you know, the, the production, one of the productions that we've done recently, you know, the, the mixing was being done out of, um, the mixing was being done out of Charlotte, uh, or, or well, uh, in, out of Georgia <laughs> and, uh, the edit is being done out of, out of Salt Lake city. Uh, we have a couple people in the office. We've got prep going on from LA. We've got all this stuff going on and, and it, you don't think about it at all. Like you're just sitting there just kind of having it all happen. Everyone's talking to each other on comms. And it was, I mean, the, the you know, the clients are in New York, it, 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 you know, and, and when you get that going, it's, uh, it's remarkable and you can't ever figure out how we did this before. So anyway, so it's really exciting. I want to thank everybody. Uh, incredible, incredible panel today uh, to talk about this. And so I just really want to uh, thank everybody for, for showing up. And uh, and sharing their 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 wealth of knowledge with uh, with our viewers and our, our producers here. So thank you so much for taking the time out on Friday. And Friday we're trying to keep on building up as a as kind of this more technical logistics you know um, process. And so we really appreciate everybody who who came today and became part of that conversation. Uh, thanks to the producers for all the great questions. Keep it keep, keep, keep us moving forward. Um, uh, we traveled uh, answering those questions. We traveled eighty three thousand miles or one hundred thirty five thousand kilometers. Uh, 864 million bananas for scale. Um, I also want to thank the incredible crew. This is a remote production. So when you're watching this, this is actually incredibly remote. All the panelists are remote. All the, the, the uh, and there's a team that has to organize that. There's a team that has to produce it. There's a team that has to uh, develop it. Um, some of those developers are here with us today. Some of the team that manages those things are here with us today. It's just an incredible, incredible team that puts this together every single day, seven days a week. We just really appreciate all your work. All right, um, let's go ahead and uh, just a reminder that you'll, uh, after hours today, starting uh, at about noon, um, probably a little bit after, but but I would start jumping in. After hours, the, um, we'll, we'll be... Uh, covering Cinegear while people just with phones. Today is informal, but this is your chance to watch what we're looking at at Cinegear. Give us your input on what you want us to cover for Saturday. Saturday, of course, Cinegear is going to be 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. So we'd love to have you. Um, you're going to see that on the stream. Um, but you'll see us um, you know, showing parts of Cinegear this afternoon um, until 6 or 7 this evening. And then uh, tomorrow we'll come back on uh, after, after the, the education hour. Uh, we're going to have, um, we will have uh, Cinegear starting at 11 a.m. Uh, and we'll be broadcasting that. We've got a couple of Teradex. We've got a live view. We've got, uh, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of fun there. So, so uh, stay tuned for as we kind of pull that, pull that all together. And you will see some other things. Keep track of Discord. Um, you'll see, we're going to be posting a couple. Um, we're going to try 4K30. We're kind of growing up a little bit. 4K30 HDR 5.1. You'll see a test probably uh, get posted. It's unlisted. So if you don't see it, if you're not there, you're not there. Uh, but uh, you'll see a, probably a half an hour, hour test of us today and tomorrow uh, from the site. So, um, so stay tuned for that. All right, let's go ahead and jump into After Hours.